The Devil's Assassin by Paul Fraser Collard Read by Dudley Hinton Chapter 1 The valley was the perfect place for an ambush. The rider scanned the steep sides with concern, his hard grey eyes roving over the heavy boulders that littered the slopes, wary in the face of the imagined danger. He saw the places where men could hide, the positions where he would disperse his soldiers if he were not the one riding through the narrow, gloomy defile. A small avalanche of stones caught his attention. Each fast-moving boulder kicked up a puff of dust, the thin, dry soil easily disturbed after so many months without rain. There was nothing to hold a man in his grave, the arid, friable surface reduced to so much sand. The rider moved his hand carefully, unbuckling the holster on his right hip. He reached inside and wrapped his fingers around the hilt of his revolver, the metal hot to touch. He felt the gun's weight, its solidity reassuring. It was ready to fire, the five barrels loaded with care that morning, each one sealed with a thin layer of grease to prevent a misfire. The rider had learned never to leave anything to chance. He could never be sure when the dacoits who roamed the high ground and preyed on the unwary and the unready would try to take the lone traveller who rode the barren lands. So he prepared for battle each day, priming his weapons and hardening his soul. His eyes were never still as they roamed over the hidden crevices, his senses reaching out, searching for danger. He stopped his horse and listened. At first he heard nothing, the lonely quiet of the high ground pressing around him. He was thinking of slipping from the saddle and putting his ear to the ground to listen for movement when he heard the rumble. It sounded distant, like an early morning express train far in the distance. His sable mount twitched its ears, sensing its master's unease, its right foreleg pawing nervously at the soil as it was ordered to wait. The rumble increased, the noise building steadily. The rider tightened his grip on the reins, shortening them and bunching them together so he could hold them in his left hand, his right clasped firmly around the hilt of his revolver. He sensed movement to his left and tugged hard at the reins, pulling on the heavy metal bit forced into his horse's mouth. He jabbed star-shaped spurs into the animal's sides, forcing it into motion so quickly that its hooves scrabbled at the stony soil. As it lurched away, he saw the source of the movement. The heavy boulders kicked soil high into the air as they picked up speed and thundered down the sharp sides of the valley. They gathered momentum as they hurtled towards the solitary rider, careering down the slope, knocking other lesser stones from their precarious perch so they created an avalanche that roared downwards in a wild melee of dust and stone. The screams of the thugs echoed around the cramped confines of the valley as they unleashed their ambush. Ever since William Bentinck had taken over as governor of Bengal in 1830, the British authorities had brutally suppressed the followers of the cult of Thagi. These worshippers of the goddess Kali had been the target of a concerted campaign to eradicate them until only a few scattered bands remained, their brutal ritualistic killings a threat only to those foolish enough to travel the wild and lonely roads far from the influence of the British. The rider reined his horse hard round, blinking away the dust that rolled over him. The inhuman shrieks of the ambush rang in his ears, drowning out even the heavy thump of his heart. The familiar icy rush of fear flushed through him before settling deep in his gut. There it twisted, churning his insides like a beast fighting to be freed, but imprisoned, held captive by the barriers he had constructed to contain it. The first thug leapt over the fallen boulders, screaming like a banshee as he charged the rider, 
the naked steel of his tulwar catching the sun as he flashed it overhead, readying the first blow. The rider lifted his right hand. The fear was controlled, the bitter calm of experience overriding the terror of the ambush. The thug was close enough for the rider to see the animal snarl of hatred on the man's face, the bared teeth as he howled his wild war cry, the bearded face beneath the stained pagdi twisted with rage. The revolver coughed as the rider pulled the trigger. The bullet thudded into the thug's face, smacking him backwards as if his feet had been pulled away sharply by an invisible rope. His corpse hit the ground like a rag doll. The contents of his skull spread wide, staining the dusty soil red. The other ambushers did not hesitate. The rider had time to see the dirt on their faded robes, the tears and the rents in the worn fabric. The next face filled the simple sight on his revolver, the same visceral expression of hatred looming into view for no more than a single heartbeat before he pulled the trigger once more. The man was punched to the ground, the revolver's heavy bullet tearing through flesh and bone with ease. The second would-be killer crumpled, his pathetic twisted corpse left lying no more than a yard away from the first. The two remaining bandits rushed the rider. He got off a third wild shot as they came close, but the deadly missile cracked past the ear of the nearest thug to score a thick sliver of stone from one of the boulders that had been meant to crush the rider into oblivion. The rider gouged his spurs cruelly into his horse's sides, forcing it to lurch forwards. He rode at the surviving bandits, charging his enemy. They closed at terrifying speed, coming together in a sudden blur of movement. The bandits had no time to slow their wild attack, and the rider was past them before they could react. The treacherous ground gave way under their boots as they tried to turn to face him. One slipped, his curse the last sound he would ever utter. The rider had forced his mount into a tight turn the moment he had burst through the pair of bandits. He let the still-smoking revolver fall from his hand and drew his sword. It was a fabulous weapon, the kind found in tales of valiant knights and beautiful damsels. Writing flowed down the length of the steel blade, the swirling script etched deep into the metal. The golden hilt wrapped snugly around the hand of the man wielding the sword, its dark red sharkskin grip mottled and stained from use. It was the blade of a prince and it cut through the fallen bandit's neck, slicing through the gristle to leave his head half-severed, the blood darkening his filthy robes. The last bandit threw his tulwar across his body in a wild parry as the glorious sword whispered through the air, keening for his flesh. The rider twisted his wrist as he brought the weapon scything backwards, aiming the next blow even as the bandit attempted to recover from his first desperate parry the fabulous sword moving quicker than the eye could follow. The attacks followed swiftly, one after the other. The rider sat on his horse as though the two were one single monstrous beast, his skill instinctive. His pace never once faltered, forcing the last thug to scramble clumsily up the side of the valley in a desperate attempt to keep the steel from beating aside his defence. The bandit screamed, his terror-given voice as he slipped and fell, his notched and pitted tulwa knocked from his hand by the relentless salvo of blows that came at him. The rider remained silent, even in the moment of victory. The thug scrabbled on the ground, trying to escape his fate. He had time to look once into the rider's merciless eyes before the tip of the beautiful sword pierced his heart the rider forced to lean far forward in the saddle as he drove the steel deep into his enemy's flesh. The rider twisted his sword, releasing the blade from the body of his fallen foe, then carefully manoeuvred the horse backwards, leaning from the saddle as he scanned the valley, looking for any threat that he had missed. A lone vulture met his gaze. The wizened old bird flapped its wings lazily as it landed on one of the boulders that had been meant to kill the white-faced rider. 
For a moment, man and bird stared at one another, the last two living creatures in the narrow valley contemplating the sudden arrival of death in such a remote place. The rider slipped from the saddle. He wiped the sleeve of his coat across his face, smearing away the river of sweat that had run down to sting his eyes. The wool was heavy, the fabric poorly woven. The garment was not tailored to fit and it bunched uncomfortably over the rider's shoulders. The red cloth showed the ravages of weeks in the saddle, but its pedigree was still recognisable. It was a uniform made famous the world over by the men who had sheltered beneath its folds. It was the red coat of a British soldier. The rider retrieved his revolver, a wry grimace appearing on his lean face as he inspected the metal and saw the deep scratch that the impact with the stony soil had scored into its side. He paid no heed to the four corpses that littered the ground. He was long accustomed to death. He walked quickly back to his horse, anxious to be away. He murmured quietly to calm the beast. The first sounds he had uttered since the four wandering thugs had launched their sudden ambush. Then, with a single bound, he hurled himself into the saddle and turned his tired mount to face the path that had been partially blocked by the fallen boulders. He let the horse pick its own way through the rubble, turning his back on the men who had sought his death leaving them to the vulture and the other animals that would relish a feast of fresh flesh. Another band of dacoits was no more. He reached into the saddlebag that contained the ammunition for his revolver. He frowned as he saw how few cartridges were left. His days wandering the lonely paths were coming to an end. He would have to face a return to civilization, to the people he had rejected for so long. He gathered his horse's reins in one hand and urged it to pick up the pace. It would take him many days to reach his destination, but he was in no hurry. He had not set out to be alone for so long, but he still did not feel the need to find company. The days had dragged into weeks, the weeks into months, but he would not rush to find the future as once he had. He would let it find him. Chapter 2 Bombay, October 1856 The British officer was sprawled in the leather club armchair, a week-old copy of the Times laid carelessly on his lap. Three bottles of bass beer sat on the drum table beside him, their precious contents long gone. The officer slept fitfully, despite the effects of the food and drink he had consumed. He was not alone in the guest's lounge. It was the time for rest, for slumbering through the hottest hours of the day, when all sensible fellows retired to the cool of the lounge or slunk away to their beds to await the fresher air of evening. The better echelons of Bombay society had only just returned to the city, and they slipped into a coma of indolence after tiffin, hibernating until evening arrived and the coaches came to collect them for a turn around the esplanade or, for the more energetic, a drive to the splendour of the Malabar Hills or the harsh beauty of the black rocks at the breach. Excuse me, Sahib. The proprietor of the Hotel Splendid stood at a respectful distance, contemplating the British lieutenant as he fidgeted in his sleep the starched collar of his shirt bent and distorted as his head twisted from side to side. Abdul El Amir was painfully aware that he had paid for the starch in the officer's collar, just as he had paid for the bottles of beer that had helped induce the afternoon siesta. The lieutenant's bill had been unpaid for the last fortnight, a state of affairs that had inspired Abdul to rise from his own afternoon rest to disturb his guest's peaceful nap. Sahib. Abdul was a slight man. He rarely ate, preferring to obtain his sustenance from the hookah that was never far from his side. Yet it was a rash man who took his lack of bulk for weakness. He might be a Muslim in a Hindu world, 
but his connections with the local gang of dacoits made him a formidable adversary, even for a sahib. Abdul El Amir was not a man to be crossed. The British officer jerked at the abrupt summons, his breath snorting in his nose as he awoke. I am so sorry to disturb you, Sahib. Please forgive me. Abdul bowed low at the waist, though his simpering smile did not reach his eyes. The lieutenant rallied quickly, wiping a shirt cuff across his mouth and running his fingers over the thin layer of dark hair that had been cut unfashionably short. He sported several days' growth of stubble, but was otherwise hair-free, something of an oddity amongst the fabulous beards, moustaches, whiskers and mutton chops favoured by most of the British officers who passed through Abdul's hotel on their way in or out of Bombay. What can I do for you, Abdul? The British officer addressed the proprietor in the calm tone of a man well used to being in control. He gathered up the remains of the Times carefully folding it before placing it underneath one of the empty bottles on the table at his side. Abdul reached inside his cream robes. Like most locals, he wore a long, flowing kurta devoid of all decoration. His sole concession to fashion was a fabulous scarlet waistcoat covered with the images of a thousand flowers, each picked out in exquisite detail, the fine thread and bright colours an indication of the garment's value. There is the small matter of your bill, Sahib. I fear there has been some mistake, as it does not appear to have been settled as I requested last week. The officer reached behind him to pull his scarlet coat onto his shoulders, the single crown that denoted his rank catching the light. The cuffs of the red shell jacket were green, and the sphinx on the collar revealed that the officer served in the 24th Regiment of Foot, the Sphinx was the legacy of a battle fought in Egypt against Napoleon back in 1802. It was an honour worn with pride by all who joined the regiment, a symbol of the men who had died in its name, a symbol the man dressed in the uniform of one of its lieutenants had no right to wear. How remiss of me. Here, leave it with me and I'll see to it. The officer reached for the offending document. Abdul hesitated, pulling the sheet of paper away from the questing fingers. In cash? For the first time, the lieutenant's annoyance showed. His hard eyes fixed on the proprietor. I will arrange for a transfer of funds. Cox and Cox will be only too pleased to assist with the transaction. I would prefer cash in the circumstances. The smile was gone now. With a nonchalance born of long experience, Abdul turned and beckoned to one of his men. So be it. The officer made no show of having noticed the heavy-set enforcer Abdul had summoned to join the conversation. The man must have stood close to seven feet tall and was built like a brick outhouse. The threat was clear. And... Today, Sahib, not tomorrow or the day after. Abdul offered the bill, bowing at the waist as he held it towards the seated officer. There was no trace of fear on the lieutenant's face, even with the bulk of the enforcer looming large over his chair. Instead, he sighed, as if disappointed by the display. I understand. The hotel's owner sneered at the mild response, his thin moustache twitching. Thank you, Sahib. He turned and waved his bodyguard away before leaving the British officer to his afternoon at leisure. He was not concerned that his unabashed approach risked losing him a guest. His hotel was always full, the lack of accommodation in Bombay forcing a steady stream of white-faced Ferangi to stay in his establishment before they went up country. Abdul made sure that the place appealed to a certain class of officer. His was one of the few guest houses in the city that could boast a bath for every half-dozen guests, and he kept the best British beer chilled and ready. For the more discerning guest, 
There was even a ready supply of clean, beautiful women, available at any hour of the day or night. Abdul might be a violent thug at heart, but he knew what his particular type of customer valued most of all. Jack Lark sat in his darkened room. He savoured the solitude, enjoying the peace that only came when he was alone. It had been a struggle to become accustomed to being around so many people after so long spent with no one but his horse for company, and part of him craved a return to the airy quiet of the high ground. A life alone was so much easier than one where others encroached to prod and poke into his affairs. With a sigh he began gathering together his belongings, packing them into his worn leather knapsack. He kept back his one good uniform, the dress of a lieutenant in the 24th Regiment of Foot ensured he was not often troubled on the turbulent streets of Bombay, except, of course, by the hundreds of hawkers and stallholders desperate to have him part with the coins they believed he carried. The other officers and civilian officials would leave him be, allowing him a freedom of movement he could never hope to enjoy if he wore the simple red coat of an ordinary soldier. He had spent two weeks in the dubious surroundings of the Hotel Splendid. He had chosen his accommodation with care, locating a place that asked few questions of its clientele. His first steps back into society were cautious ones, and the anonymity of a place like the Hotel Splendid suited him very well. He bundled the worn red coat of a private soldier into a ball, stuffing it to the very bottom of his knapsack hiding it away until he next left the confines of polite society and ventured back to the wild lands. He laid his few shirts and a spare pair of breeches on top of a blue uniform coat that was creased and rumpled for being hidden for so long, and added four freshly purchased boxes of ammunition for his handgun, ensuring that he had easy access to this most important of all possessions. He had learnt that the bullion of his epaulets could only be trusted so far. Sometimes there was nothing better than a fully loaded five-shot Dean and Adams revolver to ensure his safety. Packed and ready to leave, he sat back heavily on the cast-iron bed, taking a few moments' rest before he moved on. The room was hot and stuffy despite the large window that was kept open every hour of the day and night. A thin grass screen known as a tatty covered the opening. Every few hours one of the hotel's servants came to douse the tightly woven grasses in water. It cooled the room for a while, adding a delicate fragrance to the sweaty atmosphere before the heat outside baked it dry once again. Jack had wandered his way towards Bombay thinking to find some anonymity in the bustling hub of the British Empire's presence in India. He had many pressing needs, the most important of which was money. Only with a full pocketbook could he begin to rejoin the world he had walked away from. Until he could find a way to raise some rhino, he would have to live on his wits, finding the necessities of life where and when he could. Wherever he went, he brought his past with him, a burden much heavier than the single knapsack that carried all he possessed. Bitter memories lurked in the depths of his mind, festering in the darkness. He had learnt to control his thoughts, forcing them away from the recollection of the life he had lived. He had not always been alone. He had once been an ordinary redcoat, planning for a future with the woman he loved. When that had been snatched away from him, he had been left alone without hope and without a future. So... He had stolen a new life, taking the identity and the papers of his deceased commander. He became the officer he had always dreamt of being, securing the station in life denied him due to his low birth and the lack of the one commodity that society judged the most important when selecting those granted the power of an officer's rank, money. As an officer, he had thrived, leading his stolen company into battle in the Crimea. In the terrifying encounter at the Alma River, he had discovered the ability to fight and to set the example that men needed if they were to function when their lives were on the line. 
where some found an aptitude for working with wood or for shaping iron, the art of killing had become his trade. He had come to India in search of a new life, but so far he had found nothing but war. His skills on the battlefield needed once again as the British authorities strove to oust the Maharaja of Sawad from his kingdom. When diplomacy had given way to violence, Jack was once again forced to fight for his country, his duty tethering him to the British army no matter what his heart desired. Now he was alone once again, bereft of ties to family or regiment. He'd assumed the name of a dead lieutenant, a man he was reasonably certain no one would know in the eclectic society of Bombay, where he hoped to start again, far away from his past. For the spark of ambition still flared deep inside his battered and troubled soul. He was determined to prove, to a world that neither knew nor cared, that the product of London's vilest rookeries could achieve so much more than polite society allowed. It was the one honest thing he had left, and he clung to it like a recently converted soul clung to their new faith. Sahib! How may I help you? Abdul sat up abruptly. He had been dozing. The hookah pipe was dangling from the corner of his mouth. He put it to one side and straightened in his chair, making a mental note to berate his hapless clerk, who had forgotten the strict instruction that the hotel's owner should not be disturbed. Jack smiled. I've come to settle my account. Abdul simpered, the thought of money assuaging his anger. That is most gracious of you, Sahib. I am so sorry for having brought the matter to your attention, but we all have bills to pay. He spread his arms in apology, conveniently forgetting the implied threat he had delivered alongside the bill. You have the cash? Of course. But I thought you might like to take part in a little financial transaction in lieu of the debt. Abdul's eyes narrowed. What sort of transaction do you have in mind? I have a certain object that I wish to sell. I thought to ask for your assistance in the matter. What kind of object? Abdul's accent became thicker. He could not hide the spark of avarice that the British officer's request had kindled. Jack slipped a hand into a pocket. With his eyes fixed on the hotel owner, he flicked a single fat ruby onto the mahogany desk. He saw the swift lick of the lips as Abdul sized up the jewel, the flicker in the man's soft brown eyes as he contemplated its value. Jack knew he would be cheated. He did not expect to get more than a fraction of the ruby's true worth, but he was penniless and he needed some ready cash. He was not in a position to sell the gem openly. Not even the uniform of a British officer was sufficient protection against the barrage of questions a legitimate dealer would ask. Jack was a charlatan and a fraud. He had to deal where and when he could. If that meant supping with the devil, then all he could do was pass the port. It is a difficult thing you ask, Abdul sat back in his chair as if trying to distance himself from the precious jewel that had appeared so miraculously. I cannot sell such an object. Jack recognised the tone. The first stage of the barter had begun. I'm sure a man with your contacts can find a buyer, even for a trifle such as this. Abdul leant forwards. His hand reached for the gem, but he hesitated before he could touch it, as if he had become suddenly nervous. Where did you come by such an interesting item? It was a gift. A gift? You have some generous friends, Sahib, and you have an inquiring mind. Be careful it does not get you into trouble. Abdul sniffed at the threat. Do you have more? No, Jack's reply was firm. I 
may be able to do something. Abdul smiled with all the warmth of a cobra. It is, as you say, just a little thing. There's a good fellow. Jack gave no impression of caring whether the sale of the stone would be easy or hard. His expression was neutral. Abdul reached out and smothered the gem with his hand, snatching it away and hiding it in the depths of his robe with the speed of a striking scorpion. Jack turned and was about to walk away when he stopped, as if struck by a sudden thought. You wouldn't think of cheating me, would you, Abdul? He asked the question gently, as if making an innocent inquiry about something as inconsequential as the weather. Abdul scoffed at the idea with a short cackle of laughter. Of course not, Sahib. But it would be unfair for me not to take some sort of commission, no? It was hard for the hotel's proprietor to keep the glee out of his voice. How much? Fifty percent. It was Jack's turn to laugh. <laughs> that's not commission. That's robbery. All trace of laughter was gone. Abdul's face was hard. Non-negotiable. He stumbled over the longer word, but there was no doubt he meant what he said. Jack looked at his boots. He knew he had no choice, yet he wanted Abdul to know what would happen if he cheated him too badly. The steel whispered from its leather scabbard. The beautifully decorated blade hummed as it slipped through the air, moving quicker than the eye could track. The razor-sharp tip stopped no more than half an inch from Abdul's throat. Do not cross me, Abdul El Amir. Jack's voice was like stone. The tip of the blade pressed forward, caressing the soft flesh at the base of the hotel owner's throat. I am not a man to be taken lightly. Abdul smiled sickly trying to ignore the threat of death that hovered so close to his skin that he could feel the heat radiating from the blade. Of course, Sahib. How can you doubt me? Jack held the blade still. He knew his display meant little, but it was good to feel the coarse shark skin under his fingertips, the power of the sword resonating in his soul. He reversed the blade, thrusting it back into the scabbard at his side. He hoped Abdul had not looked at the weapon too closely. The golden hilt was decorated with half a dozen other precious stones, each as beautiful and valuable as the ruby that had now disappeared into the hotel owner's clothing. A single setting was empty, its precious contents prized free to buy Jack some time. Chapter 3 Jack sniffed once before he buried his face in the collar of his uniform. He wished that he had thought to bring a fresh handkerchief to cover his mouth and nose and prevent the god-awful stench from making him want to retch. It was not a long walk to the Esplanade, but he already regretted not jumping in a dolly. He might slowly be getting used to being around so many people, but he had yet to become accustomed to the fetid air that lay over the city like an ever-present fog. Bombay stank, no matter what the season. The stench of its bazaars had become quite famous. It was claimed that no other place on the face of the earth could rival its olfactory horrors. Visitors would recoil in disgust, and even those familiar with the filth and squalor of Calcutta would be shocked by what they discovered in the reeking streets of Bombay. Such vileness forced the white-faced ladies and gentlemen to hide away in the enclaves catering to their needs, and to escape to the cooler hills around the city whenever they could, deserting Bombay for months at a time. Jack had learnt quickly that good water was scarcer than good wine. When forced to stay in town, the British enjoyed only such drinks as they could rely on. Hodgson's Pale Ale, Tennant's and Allsop's beer were favoured over anything local, and the importers of European goods were able to generate enormous profits supplying the tastes of the Westerners. French wine and champagne were by far the most profitable, 
their high price making them the exclusive tipple of only the highest echelons of Bombay's close-knit and clique-riddled society. But, despite its horrors, Bombay was seeing improvements all the time. As more and more newcomers came to India via the overland route from Cairo to Suez, so the city's importance grew. The Bombay Golf Club had just been formed, and the ice ships that made the long journey from Boston now arrived every few days to keep the clubs and hotels supplied with the precious substance that made life in the broiling city bearable. The Bayakula Club boasted a growing membership, even though its pedigree was barely 25 years old. The fashionable crowd seeking it out as a haven of culture and taste amidst Bombay's wild bedlam. It was only now, in the cooler months of October and November, that Bombay came truly alive, the misery of the monsoon months quickly receding into memory. The esplanade was replete with pavilions set up to entertain the returning crowds, and the new horticultural gardens bustled with visitors seeking a refreshing venue for their evening promenade. The streets echoed to the sound of iron-clad hooves as carriages made the nightly journey from the ghats on the northern boundary of the city to the fabulous Hindu temple perched on the pedestal of black rock not far from the breach, where foaming surf broke upon the black rocks of the shore. Bombay thrived on its growing importance. The popularity of the overland route across Egypt was allowing it to overtake even Calcutta, as the favoured point of entry to the wilds of the Indian interior. The city might have been filthy, yet nowhere else could boast such vibrancy. To be in Bombay was to be at the heart of a great adventure. Jack slowed his pace as he approached his destination. The pavilion was full of noise and people, the sound of their revelry echoing along the esplanade. He'd overheard a group of fellow guests at the hotel discussing this particular event, and it had seemed too good an opportunity to miss, even though it would inevitably require conversation, something he preferred to avoid. Yet, he had to eat, and with the price of his ruby still to be agreed, he did not think it wise to try to extract another meal from the hotel. Good evening, sir. Are you bride or groom? The majordomo greeted the tall, well-dressed officer with a slight bow. The breeze had picked up, sweeping in across the esplanade and into the huge pavilion erected to house the 350 guests attending the wedding feast being held in honour of the marriage of the governor's niece. The awning had been positioned with care, and the wide openings in the thick canvas allowed much of the precious draught to enter the pungent interior of the pavilion. Jack paused before answering, hiding his rapid scrutiny of the happy throng under the calm manner of an officer forced to deal with a trivial request. Groom. Thank you, sir. The man tasked with controlling access to the pavilion smiled as if applauding the choice. If you could give me your name, please. He turned and selected one of two lists waiting for him on the table positioned near the entrance. Fenris. Arthur Fenris. Thank you, sir. The official began to run his thumb down the list of names. In the background, the garrison band of the Bombay sappers and miners struck up the lively 2-4 time of a polka. Many of the younger guests cried out with delight at the change in tempo and charged the wooden dance floor. The celebration was already several hours old, and ranks of empty French wine bottles stood like a silent battalion on the huge sideboards ranged along one side of the pavilion, testament to the amount of alcohol already consumed. Uh, I, I must apologise, sir. A bead of sweat ran down the Major Domo's face. It had been a long afternoon, and he was tiring of his role in the proceedings. He'd been looking forward to sneaking away from his post and enjoying one of the half-empty bottles of wine dotted liberally round the room. Uh, did you say uh, Ferris? I did not. The name is Fenris, not Ferris. There shouldn't be a problem. Alfie invited me personally. The official anxiously wiped away the sweat from his forehead. 
He had no idea who Alfie might be. There were so many young gentlemen attached to the governor's new relation that he had quite lost track. Uh, very good, sir. He took one look at the officer's lean, hard physique and the calm stare that met his appraisal, and decided to retreat gracefully. Uh, please, go ahead, sir. Enjoy the evening. I hope... The words died on the official's lips. The British officer had already left him and was striding purposefully into the heaving throng. The name is Knightley, once of Hampshire, but now stuck in this festering sore of an ass pit. The man introducing himself slurred his words. He took a huge swig of brandy, rolling the liquid around his mouth before swallowing. He grimaced as the fiery liquid burnt his throat. God, I hate this muck. Jack grinned at the show. He took a more circumspect sip of his own drink. Then have something else. Knightley snorted. I don't like any of it. He waved an arm to encompass the phalanx of empty bottles and stained glasses that smothered the table where they sat. Should have joined the bloody temperance movement. Jack caught the empty champagne bottle knocked flying by Knightley's wild gesture. He had been brought up surrounded by drunks. His mother's gin palace in Whitechapel was a thousand of leagues below this beautifully decorated wedding pavilion. He had seen all manner of men and women drunk on the filthy gin he had helped his mother water down. Drunkenness was a great leveller. Its effect the same regardless of the rank, sex or position of whoever threw the bitter liquid down their neck. He had carried them all out onto the street, the stench of their debauchery thick in his nostrils, the stink the same no matter if it were a lord or a lad from the rookery. Yet, despite all he had seen, he had never hesitated when the wine was being poured or the bottles of beer were being handed out. He beckoned over one of the dozens of servants dotted around the room. Sahib? Arak. My friend would like to try some. The servant bowed low and nodded before scurrying off towards the entrance at the back of the pavilion that led to the separate awning dedicated to preparing the evening's feast. Jack sat back in his chair, stretching out his long legs. He had made himself at home, eating his fill of the remains of the wedding feast before turning his attention to the legions of wine bottles. It was not the first time he had bluffed his way into such an event. With Bombay full of officers passing through, either travelling up country into the Mofasil or on their way to board one of the steamships heading for England, there were myriad opportunities for anyone with the gumption and the guile to make the most of them. So long as a man spoke correctly, possessed passable manners and carried himself with the right attitude, there were few limits to how far he could take himself. Knightley belched. I always hoped to become a ten-bottle-a-day man. My father... He paused as he tried and failed to hide a fart. Now he could drink claret like you or I drink water. I don't drink the water here as a rule, and neither should you if you fancy living for more than a month. Jack offered the advice as he welcomed back the waiter, who had brought a suspicious-looking wineskin to the table. You won't like this either, but... I found I've a taste for it. He emptied the champagne from two cut crystal glasses by simply tossing it onto the floor before pouring a healthy measure of the dark liquid for them both. Bottoms up. Knightley peered at his glass with caution. Is it safe to drink? Safer than bloody water? The younger man continued to stare at the arak. He was a handsome fellow who wore the uniform of a lieutenant with the black facings of the 64th foot. Jack knew nothing more about him and had little inclination to find out anything else. He'd found Knightley slumped at the table well into his cups. Jack usually preferred to drink alone, taking his fill and slipping away before the party crowd thinned out too much. Yet for a reason he could not truly fathom, he had taken the seat next to the young lieutenant, 
seeking the company of a stranger to temporarily ward off the loneliness that dogged his every step. Have we got any more champagne? Knightley pouted as he contemplated the evil-smelling liquid that had been presented to him. I thought you said you didn't like champagne. Now drink up. There's a good fellow. Knightley licked his lips nervously before finally lifting the glass to his mouth and taking a tentative sip. Good Lord! The young officer winced as the liquid ripped through his palate like a cannon load of canister. Jack laughed at the reaction. The natives swear by it. Knightley took a second, less hesitant mouthful. I cannot see why. Neither can they. This stuff makes them go blind. Knightley ignored the comment, holding his nose and downing the rest of his glass. He winced, closing his eyes and shaking his head like a gun dog irritated by a persistent fly. When he had recovered, he wiped the tears from his cheeks and looked at Jack through bloodshot eyes. You seem to know an awful lot about this place. Have you been here long? Long enough. You? Three weeks, four days, and a few damn hours. Knightley smiled sadly at the revelation. It's not quite what I expected. Jack snorted. So, you're a griffin. A what? A griffin. It's what newcomers are called. You shouldn't worry. It takes a while to get accustomed to being out here. It is nothing at all like home. Jack tried to hide his grimace. He had a notion that Knightley's home was a mansion in the country, with maybe a fine townhouse in London or Bath. Life was different in the rookeries. Boys like Jack were lucky to reach the age of thirty. He'd only escaped such a dour fate by joining one of the recruiting parties that came to his mother's gin palace as the British army scoured the dregs of London society for any lad likely to be able to handle a musket. Sadly, it's just like home. He looked around the room as he spoke. The sweaty faces were exactly what he expected to see, there were the keen-eyed young officers, carousing and dancing with any females under the age of forty. The matrons sitting in their cliques, gossiping behind fast-moving fans. The senior officers and company officials, their bulbous chins constrained by starched collars, gathered in sombre groups, their heavy beards and moustaches slick with sweat or stained with fallen food and wine. He had seen it all before. From the officers' mess back in England to the gathering of polite society in the cantonment in the Maharaja's kingdom on the very edge of the empire, the faces were the same. Knightley helped himself to some more of the arak. Goodness me! It's Mrs. Draper! He slunk lower in his chair, making a desultory attempt to hide. Jack looked up as an elegant lady glided past. From the clutch of fat pearls around her neck and the princely diamond in her tiny fascinator, it was clear she was the wife of a wealthy man. She was a handsome lady too, with long legs and a narrow waist. Jack found himself staring. Her blonde hair was cut shorter than was fashionable, something he did not think he had seen before. She might not have possessed the naive prettiness of a young girl, she was certainly striking. Who is she? He asked the question casually. Oh, she's the wife of Colonel Draper. And he is my colonel. And if she is here, then so must he be. Oh, God. Jack grinned at his new friend's obvious discomfort. Should you not be here, then? I should have left a week ago. The battalion's up at Karachi. I'm supposed to be with them. Why aren't you? Jack could not help but censure the young officer. He had spent time posing as a captain. He knew what it was to have to command subordinate officers like Knightley. It was a damn long voyage. I needed some time to recover. You call this recovering? Jack's reply was tetchy. 
The Redcoats deserved the best officers. They endured dreadful hardships that often culminated in being dispatched into the catastrophic maelstrom of battle. They were expected to weather everything the enemy threw at them before they were unleashed to kill, with their bare hands if necessary. To have to do so under the command of callow officers who had not the first notion of how to lead them was a disgrace. Knightley went grey, though not at Jack's biting reply. I, I think I'm going to be sick. He looked so abjectly pathetic that Jack forgot his anger. Come on. Let's get you some fresh air. He lifted the young lieutenant to his feet and half dragged, half carried him outside. On the way he caught a glimpse of a frosty glare on Mrs Draper's face. He offered a rueful smile and was rewarded with a downturn of her lips as she took in the sorry state of one of her husband's officers, her mouth puckering as if she had suddenly tasted something sour but he also noticed the sly appraisal she gave him. She was a cool-looking piece, but Jack saw the narrowing of her eyes as she studied his form. He repaid the look in kind. Mrs Draper was an undeniably attractive woman with an hourglass figure that captured his attention. He had been on his own for a long time, but he was still surprised by the sudden desire he felt fire within him. The colonel was a lucky man in his choice of wife, if not the quality of his junior officers. Chapter 4 Jack lay on his bed underneath three sheets and a blanket. The heat of the day had given way to the cooler air of the night. A few months before he would have been sleeping naked under a linen sheet liberally doused in cold water. Now, with the rainy season past, the nights quickly grew cold and he was glad of the extra blanket. He lay in the darkness thinking of Sarah Draper. His lust was like an itch that he could not reach. It scratched at his mind, keeping him awake despite the copious amounts of champagne and arak he had consumed. A floorboard outside his room creaked, interrupting his thoughts. There was nothing unusual in the noise, it interrupted his rest whenever one of the guests enjoying the late-night charms of the Hotel Splendid walked past. He listened for the next creak as the guest carried on down the narrow corridor that ran outside the three rooms on Jack's side of the hotel. He heard nothing. He came fully awake. He slid his hand under his pillow, wrapping his fingers around the reassuring solidity of his revolver. Every instinct screamed out in danger, and he slipped from the bed, careful to keep it between him and the door. The draught from the window was cold on his skin, his naked body tingling as he felt the first twist of fear in his gut. The room was dark, but enough light filtered through the grass tatty at the window to let him see the door handle start to turn, slowly. He lifted the revolver aiming it at the crack that was steadily widening between the door and its frame. As he opened his mouth to challenge the unwelcome visitor, a figure burst into the room. Jack caught a glimpse of bared steel before the tulwa slashed down at the bed, the heavy blade slicing deep into the mattress. There was no need for any further proof of his attacker's intent. Jack lifted his arm and pulled the trigger, aiming the barrel squarely at the shadowy figure who had burst in to murder him in his bed. The revolver misfired. His attacker saw the flash as the firing cap went off, but failed to ignite the main charge in the first chamber. His eyes immediately picked Jack out in the gloom. Jack caught a glimpse of surprise and anger on the man's face before he leapt across the bed, the sharp tulwa slashing at Jack's head. He ducked away from the blow and threw himself under the bed, just as the assassin's blade slashed down for a second time. He saw a set of fingers grasping the edge of the door as he scrambled back to his feet, so he lashed out, kicking it shut, hearing the yelp of pain as he crushed a second would-be assassin's fingers beneath the heavy wood. He had time to snap the bolt across the door before the first attacker's blade slammed into the frame, 
missing his head by no more than an inch. He twisted away, ducking low as he threw himself past the man who had come to kill him. He had left his own sword on a scarred and battered wooden chest under the window, and he dived forward, his only thought to retrieve his blade. His hand wrapped around the scabbard, and he rolled hard to the right, narrowly missing a fast-moving thrust aimed at his naked back. He felt the madness of battle surge through him, the urge to fight, to hack at the enemy forcing all other thoughts from his mind. His own tulwa whispered from the scabbard. He let the madness have its head, releasing the wildness that had kept him alive on the vicious battlefields of the Crimea and the frontier. In the darkness of the room, it was hard to see his attacker as more than a fleeting shadow. Jack released a flurry of blows, cutting hard then following up with a quick thrust, parrying the counters before slamming his tulwa forward once again. He let the attacks flow his sword keening as it cut through the air, the powerful salvo forcing the assassin backwards. Jack went after him. There was little room for finesse, so he battered his tulwar at his enemy, hacking at the shadowy form. The assassin parried the attacks, but the onslaught was relentless. Blow followed blow until one drove the attacker's sword wide. Jack saw the opening and punched his own sword forward a shriek of incoherent rage bursting from his lips. He felt the blade slide into the man's guts, and he pushed hard, driving the tulwa deep. The man's scream was piercing as Jack twisted the sword. The assassin fell to the ground, his hands trying to pull his torn stomach together. The door was kicked open, and another figure burst into the room. Jack stepped backwards, away from his new attacker. The body of the dying assassin fell between the two men and blocked a controlled thrust aimed at Jack's naked stomach. The second attacker grunted in annoyance before launching another blow. Jack let the blade come at him, then slashed his sword downwards, slicing at his opponent's arm. The blow was weak, the angle of the attack spoiled by the dying man, who flapped and writhed in agony at their feet. But the steel of Jack's tulwa was sharp, and it sliced into his enemy's forearm, gouging a thick crevice in the flesh. You bastard! Jack twisted quickly, narrowly avoiding a counterattack. The oath came to his mouth unbidden, the rage of the fight coursing through him. Come on! He punched his blade forward his wrist already braced for the inevitable parry. When it came, he rotated his tulwa, flinging the sword backwards, slicing the sharpened rear tip at his attacker's eyes. The man backed away, as Jack knew he would. As soon as he saw the first movement, he threw himself forward, careless of stamping on the ruined body of his first victim. He leapt at his attacker, punching the golden hilt of his sword into the man's face. He felt the vicious impact, the crack of breaking bone loud over the pant of exertion that exploded from his own lips. The power of the assault drove the assassin backwards and sent him staggering out of the small room. Jack went after him, battering his sword forward again, smacking it into the centre of his enemy's face. The second blow knocked the assassin to the ground. As he fell, Jack snapped his knee forward, driving it into the man's bloodied face. The assassin crashed down, all senses gone, bludgeoned by the salvo of blows. Jack felt nothing as he reversed his blade before stabbing downwards, driving the point into the man's heart. He felt the rush of blood on his bare feet as he turned back into the room, careful not to slip in the puddle that pooled around him. The first attacker lay still, his eyes open and staring, his hands still pressed into the bloody remains of his stomach. It took Jack less than half a minute to retrieve his fallen revolver and to stuff the uniform he had worn the previous night into his knapsack. Careless of his nakedness, he left the scene of death behind him 
taking the stairs two at a time as he made for the narrow alley that snaked around the mismatched buildings of the hotel. In the alley, he paused, his chest heaving with exertion, the cold pricking at his bare skin. Only then did he curse himself for having revealed his wealth. He had taken the risk willingly, his need for money overriding his caution. Now he knew it had been both naive and foolish, and he swore aloud, his frustration building as he realised that his chance of getting the cash he needed was gone. He spat out a wad of phlegm before delving into his knapsack and retrieving his lieutenant's uniform. He would have to throw caution to the wind and leave the shadows behind. He had no other option. It was time for Arthur Fenris to fully rejoin polite society. Jack smiled as he thought of Lieutenant Knightley. The man clearly needed a friendly guardian. He remembered the rooms he had seen when he had carried the young officer home. Knightley had rented a fine suite at Hope Hall, a family-run hotel in the Mazagon area of Bombay. There was plenty of space, more than enough for a pair of young lieutenants to form a chummery as they both enjoyed their last few days in Bombay. It was time to pay his new friend a visit. Chapter 5 Arthur! Meet the girl I'm going to marry! Knightley staggered to where Jack sat in a salon just off the ballroom. It was hot in the club, but the anteroom was something of an oasis. The pucker wallers stationed around the room pulled diligently at the huge sail attached to the ceiling, producing a welcome breeze, whilst a dozen waiters stood around like so many bronze statues, ready to deliver a fresh drink at the crook of a patron's little finger. The Bayakula Club knew how to throw a party, and Jack had been happy enough to accompany Knightley to the evening's entertainment. It certainly made a change not to gatecrash an event, and for once he would try to enjoy himself rather than just seek sustenance. Jack looked up and scrutinised the dishevelled girl buried beneath Knightley's arm. She was a winsome piece, with pale gold hair arrayed in tight ringlets. He searched her eyes for some sparkle of mischief, but saw nothing but a pair of glazed hazel irises that peered back in dull, myopic happiness. By rights, Jack should have loathed Knightley. His new acquaintance displayed every characteristic that Jack despised in the officer class. He thought nothing of languishing in Bombay when he should have been on his way to join his regiment, spending the days sleeping and the evenings cavorting around town. He came from wealth, so never doubted that his future was assured, his progress through the ranks guaranteed by a family who enjoyed both income and influence. He knew little of the men under his command, of what drove a man to accept the harsh conditions of a lifetime serving the Queen. Of battle, he knew even less. And when Jack had talked gently of what it was really like, Knightley seemed to think of it as little more than a game of rugby, where one side beat the other before it was time for handshakes all round and a jolly good tea. Yet, despite his background, there was something in his rakish charm that was simply impossible to dislike. He was like a playful puppy. No matter how many times he was kicked, he simply got back on his feet and wanted to play again. Despite himself, Jack found himself liking the confident young officer. What's your name, love? He addressed the young girl in an attempt to find a redeeming spark behind the dull appearance. Dorothy. Dorothy Squires. Dorothy. Jack pronounced the name carefully. He gave the girl a smile, but she was too busy staring up at her new bow to notice. Isn't she the most beautiful creature you ever laid your eyes on? Knightley struggled with his words, and Jack could see from the grin slapped across his face that he was already three sheets to the wind. May I be the first to wish you both much happiness. Jack managed to smile for the happy couple before returning his attention to his brandy and soda. He heard them move off and was quite content to be alone. 
He just hoped Knightley did not try to bring the mousy Miss Squires back to the suite of rooms they now shared. He did not think he was ready to hear the sounds of his new friend's nocturnal revelry. Lieutenant Knightley appears to be enjoying himself. Jack turned and saw that a tall man wearing the uniform of a lieutenant colonel with the black cuffs and collar of the 64th foot was addressing him. He should be with his men, sir. Jack rose to his feet quickly, immediately respectful in the presence of a senior officer. Lieutenant colonels were not renowned for their patience. Don't I damn well know it. The colonel plonked himself down heavily in the club chair next to Jack's and waved for Jack to join him. Sit down, old chap. The senior officer sighed as he settled into his chair. I will have a word with young Mr Knightley tomorrow and remind him of his duty. Have no fear on that account. There were few other guests in the anteroom. Most were congregated in the large ballroom where the dancing and gossiping was taking place. The anteroom was a haven of relative tranquillity amidst the high excitement of the ball, and it seemed Jack was not alone in seeking some solitude from the noisy bedlam of the dance floor. Draper, 64th foot. Fenris, 24th. Jack shook the proffered hand. It was his first formal introduction. His heart beat a little faster and he wished he had not consumed so many pegs. This was the price of returning to society, and he needed to be on his mettle. He had known who the officer was the moment he had first been addressed, his badges of rank and the details of his uniform revealing his identity in a single glance. He just hoped Knightley was still capable of recognising his own commanding officer and was sensible enough to steer clear. The Warwickshire lads, eh? A fine regiment indeed, a good friend of mine served with your lot. I got caught out at Chilean Walla. Before my time, sir. I thought as much. You're alive for one thing. That damn shindig near killed the whole battalion. Jack watched Draper as he signalled to a waiting servant to bring him a drink. He judged the colonel to be in his mid-forties. There were traces of grey in the black of his hair, with a wispy cloud gathered together on one side of his heavy beard. He was a tall man and he had the purposeful physique of a boxer with wide shoulders and no sign of the paunch or double chins that affected so many senior officers. So, young man, are you on furlough? Draper turned his attention back to Jack. Jack felt his anxiety build as he faced the question. The bulk of the 24th foot were serving up in the Punjab, but it would not have been unusual for a junior officer to be in Bombay on his way either to or back from leave. Of course neither applied to Jack. I am on furlough, sir, or at least I'm at the end of it. My colonel gave me shooting leave. I have only a week or so left before I must return to my battalion. Damn pity. You youngsters need to be let off the leash once in a while. Peacetime soldiering can take its toll on the young. Although things are never quite as peaceful as they seem, of course. I hear some of your boys got themselves into a fight up in the Bundelkand whilst you were away. Jack did his best not to sit bolt upright. He had been in the thick of the fighting that had seen a single company of the 24th drawn into a desperate battle for survival when they were attacked by the local Maharaja and his men. I heard as much myself, sir. I believe it was Captain Kingsley's company. They gave a good account of themselves, I'm told. Kingsley? Draper considered the name. I've not met him. I know Blatchford. He's a good friend of mine. Jack's instincts for danger flared. Blatchford was one of the senior officers in the regiment he had chosen as his own. It was time to beat a hasty retreat. Well, sir, if... Uh, You'll excuse me. He made to leave, but his exit was blocked by the arrival of another red-coated officer. Good evening, James. I'm glad I'm not the only one wasting my evening at this tiresome affair. 
The man pulled over a third club chair before taking a seat opposite Jack. Ah, oh, don't I know it? Draper turned and summoned the closest waiter to take the new arrival's order. But Sarah said we must come, so here we are. You are a good soldier, James. You do as your general orders. Both men barked with laughter at the remark. Jack did his best to smile gamely despite the icy flush running through his veins. There was to be no easy escape. This time he could not fight his way clear. Fenris, this is Major Ballard. Works in the brain tub. Ballard, this is Lieutenant Fenris of Blatchford's mob. Poor fellow is enjoying the last few days of his furlough. Although quite why he would choose to waste his time at such an infernal affair as this is beyond me. Ballard smiled at the introduction before offering his hand. Pleased to meet you, Fenris. Jack met Ballard's gaze as coolly as he could as they shook hands. The smile on the Major's face did not meet the icy eyes that narrowed slightly as they looked Jack over. Ballard's handshake was cold and his slim fingers glided smoothly out of Jack's grip. He was clearly not a fighting officer, his soft, cool hands bereft of the dry coarseness of someone who fought for a living. May I ask what the brain tub might be, sir? Jack did his best to feign interest as he tried to find a way out of the uncomfortable encounter. The effect of the drinks he had consumed was slowing his thoughts, and it was taking an effort of willpower to fight through the fug of alcohol. I work for General Stalker. For my sins, I am in command of his intelligence department. Ballard has his fingers in so many pies that it is a wonder he is not as fat as a cow in calf. Draper had clearly enjoyed a number of drinks himself that evening, and he chortled with delight at his own comment. Certainly no one could have called Major Ballard fat. He was slim to the point of looking malnourished, with the same pinched face as so many of the army's redcoats, although theirs was normally the product of grinding poverty rather than an ascetic choice. His thin moustache was neatly clipped, and his cheeks were immaculately shaven. It was clear he took great care with his appearance. It is not quite like that. So, Fenris, when are you to return to the 24th? I'm to be back with the regiment by the beginning of November, sir. Jack picked what he considered a likely date, answering the question with as much confidence as he could muster. He would rather be facing the Maharaja's famous lancers than the twin peril of two senior officers who would both know people who should be familiar to a lieutenant in the 24th foot. We were discussing the affair up in Sawad. Draper returned the conversation to the last area Jack wanted discussed. Although I expect you know more about that than I do, Ballard. The 24th did well. Ballard watched Jack closely as he spoke. I have the full dispatch on my desk, written by a Captain Kingsley. A friend of yours? He arched a neatly plucked eyebrow in Jack's direction as he posed the question. Jack kept his face neutral. No, sir. I believe he's newly arrived in the country. He went straight to the cantonment at Bundapur, where his company was on detached duty. I serve with the rest of the regiment up in the Punjab. Well, if his account is to be believed, he did the 24th a great service. Sounds like he beat the Maharaja's army all by himself. It was hard for Jack not to snort in derision. Kingsley was a useless popinjay whom he had been forced to knock to the ground to save the man's company from destruction. Kingsley had spent the rest of the battle hiding with the sick and the wounded. Jack doubted he'd even seen the Maharaja's men, let alone fought any of them. The only success the British captain could claim was to have been the single white officer to survive the affair. Jack was not surprised to discover he had cast himself in the role of hero of the hour. The thought of the bitter fighting made him shiver, despite his best attempts to guard his emotions. He looked into Ballard's eyes. He had the feeling the intelligence officer was reading his very soul. 
He had a fine company with him. He felt the calm he sometimes experienced in battle, the fear corralled and caged in the depths of his gut. The men would have fought hard. Ballard's eyes narrowed, as if assessing every word. Which is your company, Lieutenant? Number three, company. Jack gave the answer smoothly. The real Lieutenant Fenris had been in Kingsley's company. He had tried to murder Jack in the aftermath of the battle and had died for his efforts, killed by another British officer. The memory chilled Jack, and it took an effort of will to meet Ballard's gaze. There are a number of items in Captain Kingsley's account that have me perplexed. Ballard sat back in his chair. His eyes left Jack's for the first time as he summoned another round of drinks for the three officers. I've only read the report briefly, but I'm sure he lists you amongst the fallen. Jack kept his face calm. You must have me confused, sir. There is a Lieutenant Ferris who serves in Kingsley's command. Must have been him, poor fellow. His expression was grave, as if registering the sombre news of a fellow subaltern's death for the first time. He delivered the bluff smoothly, doing his best to betray no sign that he was lying through his teeth. Ballard smiled. It was like watching a wolf trying to look friendly. You must be correct, of course. I have only had the opportunity to read the report very briefly. It is rather out of my remit, after all. However, I do recall one other interesting item. He sat back and ran his forefinger along his moustache. Kingsley goes to great lengths to describe the actions of a deserter, a man called Lark, or something of that ilk, a charlatan by all accounts. The Major seemed about to continue when there was a crash behind them. The three officers turned to see Lieutenant Knightley lying face down on the floor. Dorothy Squire stood beside him, her hand covering her mouth in shock. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen, I must see to my friend. Jack leapt to his feet, using Knightley's dramatic collapse to cover his escape. His heart pounded as he made his way to the fallen lieutenant's side, hoping that somehow Ballard had not seen the reaction his casual remark had caused. It was clear that the intelligence officer was close to discovering the truth about Jack's identity. He felt a frisson of fear. He knew it was time to move on, to find somewhere he could begin his life anew. Bombay was no longer a safe haven for an imposter. Chapter 6 Oh, God! Lieutenant Knightley contemplated the puddle of vomit on the ground between his legs. He was sitting in an alleyway a hundred yards from the main entrance to the Bayakula Club. The two officers had not gone far, but Jack was relieved to have put some distance between himself and the uncompromising scrutiny of Major Ballard. Sorry, Arthur. Jack barely heard Knightley's mumbled apology. His mind was fully engaged on escaping Bombay. He knew he would have to leave the city that very night. He did not know where he would go, but that did not concern him. He had drifted for months. To do so again held no fears. He would see what life held for him elsewhere, either far away in Calcutta or even in Madras. He would learn from his mistakes. You must regret ever befriending me. Knightley had lapsed into melancholy. I'm a complete wastrel. Jack was barely listening. He had one pressing concern. He was penniless. He had been getting by on Knightley's charity, the young officer accepting the story of a botched money draft without a murmur. Before he quit Bombay, he would need to secure some funds. His thoughts turned to Abdul El Amir and the Hotel Splendid, to the ruby he had abandoned when he had fled the assassins. Its loss grated. And Abdul had tried to have him murdered. He owed the hotel owner a visit. 
You must be sick at the sight of me. Knightley raised his hands to support the weight of his head. I'm sick of the sight of me. Jack wondered where Abdul kept his valuables. He was certain it had to be in the office where the hotel owners hid from his guests. He was no expert burglar, but he could think of half a dozen ways he could sneak into the hotel unnoticed. Once inside, he would make his way to the office and see if he could retrieve the ruby. If he managed to find other valuables or even some ready money, he would feel no qualms in taking them too. It would be a fitting revenge. You're not even listening to me, Knightley accused in a voice laced with self-pity. What's that? Jack looked down at the pathetic sight. Vomit had splattered the riding boots Knightley insisted on wearing, even though he rarely rode in the cramped confines of the city, and he stank, the sour stench of vomit catching in Jack's throat. I sicken you. I can see it in your eyes. Knightley was wallowing in his misery. I need a bloody drink. No, you need to stop pissing around and go to your battalion. Jack growled, his patience wearing thin. Knightley recoiled at the fierce words. You sound like my father. Then stop behaving like a damn child. Jack's veneer was cracking. You're an officer. You should start acting like one. Knightley fixed Jack with a look of abject misery before he bent his head and heaved what remained in his guts onto the ground. When he looked up again, his face was red and blotchy, thick strands of saliva gumming his mouth. Help me, Arthur. Please don't scold me, he groaned. Jack was spared answering the pitiful plea as a couple walked past the end of the alleyway. His heart fell when they stopped and peered into the darkness, the sight of the two British officers attracting their attention. You there! That man there! The booming voice of Colonel Draper echoed down the confines of the alley. Make yourself known! The colonel's hand went to the hilt of his sword. Uh, it's Lieutenant Fenris, sir. Lieutenant Knightley has been taken ill. Jack saw the senior officer hesitate, clearly torn between the need to protect his spouse from the sight of a drunken officer and his duty to address the needs of one of his subalterns. After a moment's delay, Draper led his wife into the alley. Even in the gloom, Jack could see the disgust etched on her face. He watched her closely as they approached, and smiled as her nose twitched in distaste. Lieutenant Knightley, this is badly done. Badly done indeed. Draper patted his wife's arm to reassure her as he addressed his errant lieutenant. Knightley lifted his head and saw his colonel looming over him. Oh, dear Lord. Dear Lord, indeed. Draper was clearly fighting to control his temper. Jack was certain that only the presence of his wife was preventing a violent tongue-lashing from being brought down on the head of the hapless lieutenant. You will report to me in the morning, Mr. Knightley. I'm going to say my goodbyes to the battalion before I take up a staff appointment here in Bombay, and I insist that you join me so that I can deliver you safely to Major Sterling, who will be commanding the regiment during my absence. If you fail to do so, I shall order you to be immediately cashiered and your commission to be sold. Is that clear? Knightley's head moved in an approximation of a nod. Whilst the colonel addressed himself to dealing with Knightley, Jack was carefully inspecting Draper's wife. Sarah Draper was clearly several years younger than her husband. She was far prettier than he had first thought, with slim, elegant features that had been delicately emphasised by a subtle application of makeup. Her nose was a little crooked, but it only served to emphasise the perfect symmetry of the rest of her face. Yet it was her mouth that entranced him most. 
Her lips were thin but shaped like those of a porcelain doll. They were perfect, and he imagined what it would be like to kiss her. As he studied her, he saw her returning his scrutiny. Her eyes were dark blue, and Jack saw the sparkle of life deep within them. He matched her calm appraisal, feeling the flicker of desire deep within. They stared at one another for several long moments, before Jack forced himself to tear his eyes away, lest Draper discover him staring at his wife. Mr. Fenris, I would be grateful if you would escort Mr. Knightley to his accommodation. Uh, certainly, sir. Jack's voice was husky. He glanced back at Sarah Draper and saw her mocking smile. She had recognised his desire. I am obliged to you. Draper's voice was clipped, and he showed no sign of being aware of Jack's reaction to his wife. I shall write to your colonel and commend your sensible actions. I only wish my own lieutenant could conduct himself with similar decorum. Jack did his best to hide his amusement at the remark. He wondered what the 24th's colonel would make of a letter praising an officer who had vanished several months earlier. Out of the corner of his eye, he noted the impish grin that had appeared on Sarah Draper's face as she listened to her husband's pompous gratitude. He was clearly not alone in finding entertainment in the late-night encounter. He risked a final glance in her direction and felt a warm flush as he saw that she was staring straight at him. For the first time, the icy facade slipped, and she smiled before looking away, fixing her gaze on her husband and dipping her head demurely. Jack stood silent, watching as Draper escorted his wife back down the alley. He stared for a long time at the tight behind moving under the folds of the soft blue dress, wondering if he was reading too much into the silent exchanges. Then, with a sigh, he forced the matter from his mind and reluctantly turned his attention towards the vomit-smeared lieutenant he had befriended. But even as he heaved nightly to his feet, his mind savoured the image of the colonel's wife. He would dearly like to meet Sarah Draper under other, more intimate circumstances. Tucking his arm around the bedraggled nightly, he began the long walk back to their hotel, forcing the lustful thoughts from his mind. For better or worse, his time in Bombay was done. As tantalising as Sarah Draper might be, he knew it was nothing more than a passing fancy, one he would have to ignore if he were to ensure his own safety. He could not afford to stay in the city in the hope of seeing her again, not now that he had sensed Ballard had scented his trail of lies. There was one last act he wanted to perform. Then it would be time to quit Bombay and try his luck elsewhere. The hotel Splendid was still in the quiet hours before dawn. The trellis was old, and it creaked as Jack gingerly placed his full weight on its lowest spur. A thousand insects erupted from the dense foliage of the ancient jasmine that had made the rickety structure its home, and he paused, letting the cloud disperse, his mouth and eyes screwed tight shut, lest they offer an attractive oasis to any of the multitude of flying creatures. When the crowd of insects had passed, he took in a last deep breath before trusting his luck once again on the aged wood that reached up to the single window high above him. He had spent the day preparing for the expedition as best he could, Knightley had wisely obeyed his colonel and was now finally on his way to join his regiment, so at least Jack had been able to get ready without having to explain himself to his friend. Knightley had very kindly paid for his rooms for another few days, allowing Jack to stay on a little longer if he so wished. But Jack intended to be on his way long before he was forced to leave the comfortable suite. There was just time to secure his own funds and restore his independence before he disappeared. His lieutenant's uniform was not perhaps the most common dress for a burglar, but Jack wanted the security of his officer's rank should he be discovered in or around the hotel. 
He'd left his revolver behind, trusting to the tulwar hanging at his hip and a stout cudgel that he had bought that day in the bazaar. He did not expect to have to fight, but he could not have considered risking the escapade without his sword. He would have felt more naked without the sharpened blade than he had facing the would-be assassins wearing nothing at all. The spars of the trellis creaked alarmingly as he scaled the wall. The scent of jasmine was making his eyes water, the pungent aroma catching at the back of his throat. The heady smell tickled his nostrils, and he felt the beginnings of a sneeze. He stopped climbing and tried to stifle the sensation. The situation suddenly felt absurd, and he had to control the urge to laugh out loud, the sheer folly of the midnight escapade catching up with him. He had imagined his career as an imposter ending in so many ways, being caught sneezing halfway up a trellis while trying to burgle a fourth-rate hotel had not been one of them. A sharp splinter scratched at his hand and concentrated his mind on his task. He decided it was time to gamble, and ignoring the ominous cracks as his weight snapped some of the bars of the old wood, he tried to move faster, reaching up as far as he could, ignoring the burning in his arms as he hauled himself up the wall. Handhold by handhold he clawed his way up to the single window that overlooked the alleyway. When he reached the stone lintel, he hauled himself up the last few feet, his hands taking a firm grip on the cold stone, and with a final effort, heaved his backside onto the ledge where he sat sucking at the cut on his palm and calming his ragged breathing. The alleyway beneath him looked no more than a few feet away, and he could barely credit the effort he had expended to climb such a short distance. The weeks in Bombay had softened him. Carefully, he pushed back the simple grass screen that was all that covered the opening. The landing inside was dark, but enough moonlight was filtering through other grass-screened windows to let him see. All was quiet. He slid himself inside, taking care to land gently on the tiled floor. He made sure to shut the tatty, ignoring the temptation to wipe away the sticky red handprint he had left on the stone ledge. There was no time to dally. He walked swiftly through the sleeping hotel. He had no need to be silent. There were always people walking around the hotel, even in the depths of the night, and it was unlikely that any of the night servants would challenge someone they would naturally assume was a guest. He took the stairs two at a time, his boots loud on the whitewashed stone. The inner depths of the hotel were cool after the exertion of his climb, but he was still forced to wipe away the thick band of sweat that covered his face. He wondered again at the sanity of his decision to add burglary to his list of crimes. He had known a few thieves in his time. His first orderly had been a regular Jack Shepherd, but he had never expected to be forced into the role himself. A servant bustled past, carrying a bucket that stank of fresh piss. Jack simply ignored his presence and kept walking, careful not to even glance at the young boy, who scurried on as quickly as he could, his attention focused on not spilling any of the noxious liquid he carried rather than on the guest wandering the hotel in the small hours of the night. It did not take long to reach Abdul's private sanctum. Jack remembered that there was a small anteroom outside the office itself. He paused, taking a moment to compose his thoughts and to steel his mind as he prepared to force his way inside, then tried the handle of the outer door. It was locked. Had he been a proper burglar, he would have known how to pick the lock, a basic requirement for any practitioner of the panny. It was the sensible course of action, the need to remain quiet of more importance now that he was out of the areas where the hotel's guests would be expected to reside. He turned the handle a few more times in the vague hope that somehow the lock would magically decide to yield. It did not. He stepped back. There was only one solution. It was time for the tried and tested method of entry employed by the British Redcoats. He lifted his leg aiming the heel of his boot at the space just above the lock, then took a deep breath and slammed his foot against the wood. 
The door crashed back on its hinges. Jack was in the room before it had stopped moving. He saw the scuffed and battered desk where Abdul's clerk worked for more than a dozen hours a day, but he had no interest in the neat, copperplate-filled ledgers littering the desk. He looked up and saw the door to Abdul's private room and made straight for it. It was time to retrieve what was his. Chapter 7 Abdul El Amir woke with a start as the door to his clerk's office crashed open. He had been sleeping at his desk, the hookah he had been smoking lying still warm on the blotter next to his head. He had run the Hotel Splendid for more than twenty years, fleecing his guests since the day he opened, overcharging for everything he could think of. Every type of crook and beggar was at his disposal, and he was not above having his guests robbed, swindled, or even, on one or two memorable occasions, murdered. In all that time, no one had ever dared to try to rob him. He heard the loud footsteps in the outer office, the heavy tread making directly for his own private room. He reached for his desk drawer, his thin fingers fumbling with the lock before his shaking hands opened it to reveal the stash of weapons he kept inside. He eyed the door before making his selection. As he lifted his weapon of choice from the drawer, he felt calm descend on him. He sat back in his chair and lifted the hookah to his mouth, sucking hard to breathe life back into its smouldering heart. He was no longer frightened. He lifted a hand and settled his red fez so that it sat neatly on top of his bald head. He was intrigued to know who had dared smash their way into the heart of his establishment. He would discover who it was, and then he would kill them. The door to Abdul's private office was closed. This time Jack did not hesitate. He kicked hard driving his heel into the heavy wood over the lock and sending the door flying back to smash into the wall behind it. He charged into the room, very aware that the noise he was making would bring servants scurrying towards their master's room. He would not have long. He stopped in his tracks. He was staring into the barrel of a revolver. Ah, Lieutenant Fenris. Jack looked at the calm, smiling face of Abdul El Amir. The revolver was aimed straight at his heart. It was a Dean and Adams five shot, a twin to the one he usually carried himself. He knew how dreadfully effective the weapon could be. At such close range, it would kill him. The owner of the Hotel Splendid smiled wider as he saw the look of shock on Jack's face and his finger curled around the trigger, the smooth action pulling it back the instant pressure was applied. In the cramped confines of the office, the explosion as the revolver fired was shocking. The gun kicked in Abdul's hand, the recoil throwing his arm backwards. He was on his feet in a heartbeat, knocking his chair to the floor in his eagerness to check the body. He raced around his desk, keen to see how sharp his aim had been to discover if his latest purchase had been worth the expense. Jack lay on the ground, curled into a ball, his legs tucked to his chest. His ears rang from the blast of the revolver, but he did his best to still his racing heart. He opened his eyes a fraction and saw the white robe rush round the desk, he could just make out the red velvet slippers underneath its heavy hem, and he watched for them to come to a halt, as the man who had just tried to kill him stood over what should have been a bloody, tattered corpse. He had felt a wave of terror rush through his veins as he saw the implacable face behind the weapon. He had believed he was entering an empty office. Instead, he had found a room where death waited patiently for him to arrive. In desperation, he had thrown himself to the ground just before Abdul pulled the trigger, gambling that the hotel owner would not be able to follow his movement in the excitement of opening fire. His breath had been driven from his body by the hard landing on the scuffed tiles floor, 
the hilt of his sword driven painfully into his ribs. But he had screwed his eyes tight against the pain, holding back the rage that followed the first icy rush of fear. His fingers closed over the weapon he had bought that afternoon in the bazaar, and he pulled it free, readying it for use. Now he roared as he launched himself to his feet. The cudgel cut through the air and slammed into Abdul's belly. There was just enough time to see the horror and surprise on the man's thin features before the force of the blow bent him double, his fez tumbling to the ground and rolling to bump against the wall under the room's only window. Jack chopped the cudgel downwards, bludgeoning the hotel owner to the floor. He was on him in a heartbeat, twisting the frail body around, his fingers digging into the sparse flesh without mercy as he forced the battered hotel owner onto his back. Hello, Abdul. Jack leered down into the face of the man who had cheated him. That wasn't a very friendly way to greet your business partner, now was it? Abdul El Amir's eyes were glazed. He opened his mouth, but nothing came out save a thin trickle of blood from where his lips had been crushed against his teeth by the hard landing on the floor. Jack had no time for pity. He slapped the man once across the face, bringing him to his senses. Where's my bloody ruby? Abdul lifted his hands as if trying to shoo his attacker away, only for Jack to knock them to one side. The tall British officer straddled the hotel owner's thin body, his weight pressing down and threatening to suffocate Abdul where he lay. He would not move until he had what he had come for. I don't know. Jack slapped Abdul's face for a second time, cutting off the words in mid-flow. Enough. Don't go kicking up a fucking shine. Where is it? Abdul closed his eyes in an attempt to escape his ruthless attacker, but Jack was in too much of a hurry to be merciful. He shook the man by the shoulders, careless of banging the back of his head hard against the floor. He heard footsteps outside, and looked up in time to see the horrified face of a young boy of no more than ten years old peering into his master's office. The youngster shrieked in astonishment at what he saw before taking to his heels, screaming for all he was worth. There was no time left. Jack hauled Abdul to his feet. The man weighed nothing, and Jack slammed him against the wall. He reached down and plucked the forgotten revolver from the floor before pressing it against the base of the shaking hotel owner's neck. You cheated me he snarled as he ground the barrel of the weapon into the man's flesh. You took what was mine, and then you sent those dogs to kill me. He heard a squeal of protest, but he ignored it. I bet you got a nasty bloody surprise when you found the bodies. That wasn't part of your plan, now was it? He heard more shouts and screams echoing around the hotel. He knew he had only moments before some of the hotel's guards arrived to save their master. So, now I'm going to kill you. You understand? He pushed his face forward so he could growl the words directly into Abdul's ear. I'm going to blow your fucking brains out. Spittle was flung from his lips to land on the terrified man's face. And I hope it fucking hurts. He pulled back, stretching his arm taut as he prepared to fire the revolver. As he did so, he heard the sound of running water. Abdul El Amir, proud owner of the Hotel Splendid, had pissed himself. This is your last fucking chance, you shit-eating toad. Where's my ruby? Jack's eyes kept flicking to the open door. At any second, he expected to see a rush of people come running to their master's rescue. He was prepared to change his aim, ready to send a flurry of shots into the first men he saw. Abdul was waving his arm, pointing to the wall furthest from the door. Where? Jack screamed the word. He took up the tension on the trigger, making the gun's chamber revolve so that a fresh cartridge was beneath the hammer. Under the floor. 
the words were barely intelligible. Jack risked a glance over his shoulder. He saw the rug on the floor against the wall. It was an odd place for a fine Persian rug, and at once he understood the hotel owner's terrified gestures. If you move one fucking muscle, you're dead. He was already backing away as he made the threat. He kicked the red and gold rug to one side and saw the small ring handle buried in the floor. Keeping the revolver aimed at the hotel's owner, he squatted and tugged at the handle. The hidden cache opened easily, the mechanism well oiled and silent. The hiding place held a single wooden casket secured by a padlock. It was small, no bigger than an army shako, but it was heavy. He lifted it out and tucked it under his arm, then quickly scanned the room for a way out. There were loud shouts coming from beyond the outer office and shadows flickering across the far wall. Jack raised his arm, aiming at the open doorway. As soon as the first figure appeared, he fired. The recoil snapped his arm back, but he was ready for it, and he adjusted his aim and followed the first shot with a second and then a third. The crash of gunfire was horribly loud. The smell of the powder smoke caught at Jack's throat, and he coughed once before he was moving again. He dashed across the room and tore the grass tatty screen from the window, throwing it to the floor. The sudden gunfire had dampened the rescuer's ardour, and he heard nothing as he paused at the now open window. He saw Abdul turn his face, risking a glance at the man who had threatened to kill him. Jack stared back into eyes that were white with fear. Carefully he bent low and scooped up the fallen fez. He smiled at its owner as he placed it on his own bare head. Goodbye, Abdul. He turned and leapt through the window. Jack's breath rasped in lungs that felt as if they were on fire. He'd run without thought to direction, galloping through the maze of alleys that led away from the Hotel Splendid, thinking of nothing but escape. Despite the pain in his lungs, he felt a sense of elation. The casket he had stolen was heavy. He did not care whether it contained his ruby, so long as it held enough money to get him out of Bombay. It was time to find a new identity. His time as Arthur Fenris was coming to an end. He slowed his pace as he came to the wide thoroughfare that led from the gaps on the northern edge of Bombay to the fort at its heart. It was late at night, but there were still enough carriages making their way through the better parts of town to give him some security. He needed no more than an hour or two to gather his belongings, then he could begin his journey. For the first time in as long as he could remember, Jack felt a sudden longing for London. He'd been in India for too long. He needed a change. He needed to return to the security of the familiar. He smiled as he pictured his mother's expression when she saw her son return in the finery of a British officer. If Abdul's casket contained enough money, Jack would try to find a way to book a passage on a steamer back to England. He would go home. The carriage pulled up sharply in a loud jangle of bits and traces. It was a stylish Britska rather than the more common lumbering shigram. The door was devoid of all decoration, and Jack took a wary step backwards as it opened towards him. The inside of the carriage was dark, and for a heartbeat he was convinced that somehow Abdul had arrived to fight for his money. Instead of naked steel or a raised gun, he saw an elegant gloved hand beckoning in his direction. Get in, Arthur. Sarah Draper, wife to the commander of the 64th Regiment of Foot, looked down and smiled. Her blue eyes sparkled with life, her mouth turned up in an impish smile, like a naughty schoolgirl about to break the headmistress's rules for the first time. Jack didn't hesitate. He threw his stolen fez into the gutter and climbed into the carriage, all thoughts of his mother and home disappearing 
in a waft of French perfume. Chapter 8 Jack lay on his back and stared at the ceiling. His body ached and the pit of his spine was on fire, but the bed was comfortable, the rumpled sheets cool and the pillow soft, so it was not too much of an effort to let out a deep sigh of contentment and enjoy the rare sensation of being at peace. He felt the gossamer light touch of hair on his cheek. He turned his eyes and stared into the pale face of Sarah Draper. Have I worn you out? The question was asked with a teasing smile as she took hold of a single lock of her own hair and used it to trace a pattern across his face. She grimaced as it snagged on his thin beard. You should shave more often. You look like a navvy. Jack closed his eyes, savouring the sensation of the hair flitting across his skin. I hate shaving. Sarah laughed softly. So I can see. But I'm glad you don't have a beard. James is always leaving scraps of food in his. I can smell it when he kisses me. Jack felt a pang of guilt as his new bedmate mentioned her husband. To be a cuckold was a sorry affair. To be the one doing the cuckolding left him nursing a sense of shame, however much he had desired it. Draper's wife clearly thought nothing of it, and he wondered how many other young officers had been enslaved in her bed. Perhaps I'll ask him to shave it off. Sarah laughed at the notion. I would advise against it. Jack nestled his head into the thick pillow as he offered the advice. In my experience, men are fiercely protective of their facial hair. You can offend their wife, mock their children, ridicule their ability to drink, but never, ever remark on their choice of moustache. Sarah leant forward pressing the firm mound of her breast into his side. I expect you're correct. You are clearly a man of much experience, after all. He opened his eyes. Her face was only an inch from his. She arched her back like a cat, pressing the full length of her body into his. I wonder if your experience has taught you this. He felt her fingers wander across his chest before heading lower. He sighed. He would not be left to rest. Like this. No, you're holding it wrong. Extend your arm. It's heavy. It's meant to kill people. Sarah Draper thrust her arm forward, lunging with Jack's tulwa. She fought her imaginary adversary with a series of quick thrusts, her hair bouncing as she darted across the floor of the large bedroom. Jack watched in fascination. She was naked, and he could not tear his eyes from her. She showed no sign of minding his careful scrutiny. Was that better? I have never seen anything more perfect. Stop staring at my tits and teach me. I want to learn to fight. Jack curled his arms behind his head. He was sitting up in the messy bed, the tousled covers pulled to his waist. Sarah could practice all day as far as he was concerned. Why would you want to do that? So I can protect myself. You have me now. I'll protect you. Sarah snorted in a very unladylike manner. So will you now always be at my side? How very tiresome. She turned as she reached the far end of the room, sweeping Jack's blade through the air and nearly knocking a fine porcelain vase from its stand in the process. Am I not to be your protector then? Jack tried to make light of the comment. He did not know what he wanted from her, but it still hurt to hear her dismiss him so casually. He shook his head at his own fecklessness. Taking the wife of a colonel to bed was a foolish and dangerous decision. His lust and desire might have overwhelmed his good sense, but that did not mean he could go on with it. As much as he still desired her, he had to quit Bombay and get far away from Ballard. 
Good God, no. I cannot imagine how I would explain that to James. Besides, do you not have to return to your regiment soon? Not necessarily. Sarah seemed not to hear him. She lifted the sword close to her face, a faint sheen of sweat across her brow. Her fingers gently traced the swirling script etched into the blade. You are a strange fellow, Arthur. You intrigue me. Jack ignored the comment and ran his hand across his face. He noticed the thick growth of beard. Sarah had been correct. He did need a shave. Where did you get it? Sarah asked as she continued to inspect the blade. Where did I get what? Don't be obtuse. Your sabre. It's a tulwa, not a sabre. Sarah pouted. Don't be pedantic. Where did you get it? You don't appear to have a penny to your name, yet you carry a tulwa that is clearly worth a small fortune. How do you know I don't have a penny? Jack was keen to change the topic of conversation. He did not want to dwell on his past. The tulwa had been earned. Unlike nearly everything else he possessed, it had been neither bought nor stolen. It was his, and his alone, and it had been at his side ever since the Maharaja of Sawad had presented it to him as a reward for his bravery. I had you investigated. I don't just leap into bed with anyone, you know. You are living on Lieutenant Knightley's charity. Why stoop to that when you have a sword, oh, sorry, a tulwa? She pouted as she corrected herself. Clearly she was a woman who did not like to be wrong. That you could sell. It's not for sale. Sarah looked up sharply as she heard the warning tone in his voice. She smiled. How very intriguing. You don't want to talk about it, do you? Jack said nothing. Fascinating. She dropped the blade and crawled onto the bed, sliding along Jack's body. She saw his obvious reaction to her approach and smiled. Completely fascinating. Jack forced the buttons of his scarlet tunic into their holes, lifting his chin high as he closed the high collar of his uniform coatie. It was close to mid-morning. With her husband spending a few days with his regiment before he took up his staff appointment in Bombay, Sarah was at leisure, and she seemed fully intent on enjoying herself. She had been on her way back from a party when she had spotted Jack roaming the streets. He was grateful that she had whisked him away, but now it was time to make good on his decision to get out of the city before Ballard, or anyone else for that matter, could poke his nose into his affairs. Aren't you a little old to still be a lieutenant? Sarah asked the pointed question from the bed, where she lay on her side watching her new lover dress as he prepared to leave. Rank isn't everything, my dear. Jack quickly picked up the casket that he had hidden on a side table. Yes, it is. Sarah propped her head on one hand. Her hair fell onto her face and she used her free hand to push it behind her ear. A man should have ambition. Jack offered a wry smile at the comment. Oh, I have ambition. More than you could ever know. Truly? Sarah did not sound convinced. I will admit that you're not like the other junior officers I have met. Most of them can talk of little else other than their position in the battalion. Who is above whom? Who is buying out so-and-so? You don't seem to care. I don't. You have to make your own fortune in this life. Sarah's eyes narrowed at the odd remark. Now you are doing your best to sound enigmatic. I wish there were more like you. Everyone else is just so damn dull. Jack was feeling awkward. He addressed at her command she had ordered him to be away before she left to attend on another wife whose husband served with her own. Now that he was ready, she didn't seem to want him to go. When you leave, please don't stamp around like an elephant. Sarah smirked as she spoke, as if the comment were amusing. I don't want you to disturb my escort. Escort? Why do you need an escort? 
I thought you were going to protect yourself. Are you going somewhere dangerous? Perhaps. Who knows where I shall go? Jack smiled at her coquettish behaviour. Will you not accompany your husband then? Sarah frowned at the notion. I have other plans. I have my own path to follow. Such as? I'm writing a book. A book? Jack could not help the exclamation. Sarah Draper had not appeared to be the bookish type. She frowned. Yes. It should not astonish you that a lady is capable of writing a book. Her cheeks flushed crimson. It was clear that she took his reaction to be mockery of her literary ambition. Jack shook his head in denial. Well, don't be daft, it's not that. You took me by surprise, that's all. He retreated as quickly as a broken skirmish line. I'm not a book person. He smiled and tried to appear interested. So, what is your book about? I plan to write a travel journal, so that I can record the details of the lands I visit before we improve them and destroy their cultures. A worthy aim. You sound sarcastic. Her eyes challenged him. Not at all, it's a laudable ambition. For a woman. Jack frowned. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. Do you read, Arthur? A little. The paper, that sort of thing. Jack fought the blush he could feel on his neck. He could read, but not well. He was slowly improving, but it was still a struggle. For the first time you disappoint me. Sarah misinterpreted his reply. A gentleman should read. Jack smiled, ignoring the barb. He placed the casket under his arm and bowed at the waist. Well then, it's a bloody good job I'm not a gentleman. He turned and walked from the room. He did not think he would see Sarah Draper again. He was not certain if he regretted it or not. I say, you there, wait a moment. Jack was halfway down the stairs that led to the street when he was stopped in his tracks by a loud, hectoring voice. He turned and saw a young man moving across the upper landing to look down at him. He frowned at the rude command and started down the stairs again. He was not in the mood to chit-chat with a fool. Stay there, damn you! The man chased after Jack, bounding down the upper staircase with a sudden burst of energy. He could not have been much above twenty years of age, but he had all the arrogance of a much older man. His blonde hair was slicked back, and he was clean-shaven apart from a fine pair of sideburns. He was dressed in a fine coaty of dark blue with a golden waistcoat and cream breeches. At his side hung a slender rapier, the kind of blade favoured by the young dandies who fancied themselves as swordsmen. Jack turned and started quickly back up the stairs. The young man saw him turn and hurriedly came to a halt. Yet there was no fear on his face as his quarry marched towards him. Can I assist you in some way? Jack's words were little more than a snarl. He kept walking up the stairs, his feet thumping heavily onto the polished wood. I would have a word with you before you leave. The blonde man stood his ground, facing Jack calmly, only the whites of his knuckles on the hand that gripped the banister betraying any tension. Jack was not in the mood to be conciliatory. He knew he had wasted the day. He should have been on his way out of Bombay and far from the grasp of Major Ballard. Instead, he had passed the time dallying in a woman's bed. He could not wholly regret the episode, but he was aware that he had behaved badly by taking another man's wife. He had set out to make good his ambition to be an officer and to prove that he could achieve so much more than society allowed. He was discovering that the longer he spent in his assumed station, the more he was becoming like the callow officers he so despised. The notion shamed him. He stopped in his tracks. Well, out with it. His hand slipped to the handle of his tulwa, his fingers running over the coarse sharkskin that bound the hilt. 
The feel of it beneath his fingertips brought to mind an image of Sarah Draper cavorting naked with the weapon, and it took an effort of will to focus instead on the sneering face looking down at him. The blond man shot his cuffs before speaking. I am aware you spent the night with my sister. Jack's face twisted in a wry smile. It was odd that Sarah had not mentioned the fact that her protector was also her brother, but at least it explained the younger man's acerbic reaction to Jack's presence. If you were here, then I'm sure you heard exactly how I passed my time with your sister. The other man grimaced at the vulgar comment. I would advise you to maintain your discretion in the matter. My sister is foolish. I am not. I will not allow her to become the subject of some braggart's tale-telling. Are you warning me? Jack felt the first stirrings of anger. Yes, I am. The young man looked down his nose as he offered the pompous reply, preening like a morning cockerel proclaiming its prowess to the world. I am here to protect my sister, and I shall not fail in that sacred duty. Jack snorted. And that includes warning off the men she takes to bed. My sister's affairs are her own matter. The man's expression betrayed his thoughts on the subject. But I will not allow her name to be dragged into the gutter. I suggest you remember that when you return to wherever it is you come from. Jack stepped forward, his anger threatening to boil over. Do not presume to tell me how to behave. He stopped himself, taking a deep breath as he forced the rage back down. He could not draw his tulwa and cut down every man who annoyed him. With his emotions barely contained and without another word, he turned and went quickly down the stairs, suddenly keen for fresh air. His last sight of Sarah's brother revealed a look of smug satisfaction on the young man's features. Jack savoured the notion of slamming his fist into the very centre of the arrogant turd's face. It was not as rewarding as carrying out the act itself, but it was as good as he was going to get. Chapter 9 Jack had to blink hard as he strode along the broad pavement in front of the mansion where the drapers had rented a suite of rooms, the bright morning sunlight pricking at eyes that had become accustomed to the gloom indoors. The encounter with Sarah's brother had left him feeling drained, and as he headed back towards Knightley's lodging, he was looking forward to a few hours' rest to rebuild his strength before he left Bombay once and for all. He'd gone no more than a dozen paces when he felt the unyielding metal of a gun barrel being pressed between his shoulder blades. What the devil? His hand instinctively made for his sword handle, his first thought to draw his weapon and fight the person foolish enough to risk trying to rob an armed British officer in broad daylight. Don't go raising up a shine, chum. A calm voice came from behind him. The barrel of the gun was pushed forward, jabbing sharply into his flesh. And leave the poker where it is. What the hell is going on? Jack demanded. He could feel the barrel of the handgun pressing into his spine, so he let his hand fall away from his sword. He felt the first fluttering of fear. This was no common footpad. The voice had a London accent, one from Jack's end of the city. My master wants a word. The man who was holding the gun against Jack's back whistled once. Within moments, a black carriage had pulled up at the curb. Jack looked up as the door was thrown open. He understood at once and cursed himself for being foolish enough to waste time. He should have been on his way the moment he left the Bayakula Club. Now he would pay the price for allowing his prick to make his decisions for him. In you get, and don't try any funny business. I would hate to spoil that fine uniform of yours. Without ceremony, the gun was pushed hard into Jack's back, forcing him to step towards the open door. For the second time in twenty-four hours, he climbed up the steps into a waiting carriage not knowing what the future had in store. This time he had a notion that he would not be so pleased with the outcome. 
Good afternoon, Lieutenant Fenris. I am delighted you could join me. There was little warmth in the welcome as Jack entered the gloomy interior of the carriage with as much dignity as he could muster. Dark curtains covered the windows, and the inside was stuffy enough for him to draw a sharp breath as he tried to chew on the thick air. The man with the gun followed him inside, the barrel of his weapon never more than a few inches from Jack's side. I wish I could say I was pleased to be here. Jack sat down heavily as the carriage lurched into motion. Major Ballard smiled. I'm not surprised. I expect you were looking forward to some rest after your day's exertions. Jack bit his tongue. He had known who had arranged for him to be lifted from the street as soon as he had felt the gun at his back. Major Ballard had clearly seen through his charade. Jack's future was suddenly bleak. Ballard got straight down to business. Have you heard of a Reverend Young Summers? He asked the question mildly, as if he were merely inquiring after the weather. Jack did his best to control the shudder that ran through him. He knew the man well. His denunciation had started. I don't recall the name, he answered, as calmly as his racing heart would allow. Should I? Ballard smiled. You are a fine actor, but then that comes as no surprise given your choice of employment. It really should be the basic requisite for an imposter. He stared at Jack, clearly at ease despite the situation. I believe you may know our friend the Reverend, he continued as evenly as before. He was stationed at Bundapur with you. I've never been there, sir. Jack offered the lie, knowing it would have little effect. He was certain Ballard knew who he was. All he could do was play the game and face his fate with dignity. The Reverend Young Summers is a prolific writer. Ballard leant to one side and peeked around the nearest curtain as if the topic was of little concern to him. He has written to the London Gazette at great length about his time at Bundapur. It makes for turgid reading, but the story it contains is fantastical, to say the least. I shall make sure I look it out. Jack grissed a glance at the man who had forced him into the carriage. The gun-wielding enforcer was dressed in a thick tweed suit, wholly unsuited to the Bombay climate. On his head was a dark green deerstalker pulled low over his face. He looked more suited to a day spent hunting in the wilds of Scotland rather than for life in the more extreme and vibrant temperature of Bombay. Jack looked down and caught sight of the Colt revolver pushed hard into his ribs. His abductor might have adopted a strange choice of attire, but Jack got the feeling that he would not hesitate to pull the trigger the moment Ballard commanded him to do so. I can lend you a copy if you like. Ballard appeared to be enjoying himself, his tone convivial and almost jovial. At its heart is an account of the battle that was recently fought at Bundapur between our forces and those of the Maharaja of Suwad. He smoothed a finger across his thin moustache. To Jack, he looked like a cat cleaning its whiskers. It lacks detail and does little to add much to Captain Kingsley's report, but then I doubt the Reverend was involved in much of the fighting. What is more interesting comes after the description of the battle. Young Summers goes to great lengths to chastise the cantonment's political officer for his handling of a most curious affair regarding the abduction of his daughter and her time spent as a prisoner in the court of the Maharaja of Sawad. This sounds uh, fascinating, sir, but I really am rather busy. Could we not discuss this at a later time? Indulge me. For a moment, if you would. Ballard smiled at Jack's bold reply, clearly unconcerned by the continued denial. Young Summers offers us but one side of the story. Unfortunately, the political officer attracting such criticism, a Major Proudfoot, died during the battle, so we do not have his account of the day. Jack kept his face neutral. He knew how Proudfoot had met his end. But... If one adds the Reverend's account to that of Captain Kingsley, 
one does build up a most curious picture of events. I confess I find it all rather intriguing. Jack was spared from responding as the carriage bustled to a noisy halt. Ballard once again peeked past the curtain before turning back to face him. We have arrived. I suggest you behave yourself, otherwise my colleague here will be called into action. I can promise you he's a most excellent shot. He will not miss. The carriage door was thrown open and the steps were quickly and efficiently pulled down by a black-coated servant, who then stepped back and looked down at the floor, averting his gaze. Jack felt the barrel of the revolver press hard against his ribs. He looked into the pugnacious face of Ballard's enforcer. The man had a broad nose that had clearly been broken a number of times. The rest of the face was fleshy and covered with fine pockmarks. The man's eyes were hard and they looked at Jack with the calm detachment of a butcher about to joint a fresh carcass. Jack did not think he would survive if he attempted to escape. He let himself be led out of the carriage and through a doorway a few paces from the steps. It was clearly the back door to a fine building, but he had no notion of where he was being taken. He had a fleeting premonition that he would never leave the forbidding place that loomed up around him, but with the barrel of the gun at his back, there was little he could do to resist. Now then, to business. Ballard pulled himself closer to the desk. It was devoid of any sign of recent work, the ink blotter unstained. Jack sat opposite the major like an errant schoolboy summoned to the headmaster's study. Not that he imagined there were many headmasters who were guarded by armed men. He looked over his shoulder and saw the enforcer standing impassively by the room's only door with the Colt revolver in his hand. Escape was out of the question. It had not taken long to reach the sparsely furnished room. Jack had been stopped long enough to have his sword and his cudgel removed and the rest of his person searched by the unapologetic bodyguard in case he had any other weapons hidden on him. The heavy casket from Abdul's office was taken away, a single raised eyebrow the only indication of any interest in the odd object. He had then been led at gunpoint to the nearly empty office and left to wait until Ballard had returned. Now the Major reached into a drawer and pulled out a thick sheaf of paper which he set in front of him. He flicked through the stack quickly, as if checking everything was in order, before shuffling the pages together and fixing Jack with his piercing gaze. Your name is Jack Lark, is that correct? Jack felt his heart thump hard in his chest. No, sir. My name is Arthur Fenris, and... Ballard lifted a hand to stop him. Do not take me as a fool. Lieutenant Arthur Fenris died at the Battle of Bundapur, or at least he's presumed dead, as no one ever found his body. I rather fancy that you may be the only person who knows what happened to that unfortunate young officer. Jack said nothing, keeping his face neutral as his long masquerade surged to a conclusion around him. Kingsley and Young Summers both speak of an imposter, a man called Jack Lark. This villainous cove stands accused of having stolen the identity of one? Ballard paused as he scanned one of the pieces of paper in front of him. Captain Danbury. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, the punishment for impersonating an officer is hanging. Yet, despite the risk, Lark attempted to pass himself off as Danbury, who we know died in the Crimea. Clearly, the authorities in Bundapur saw through this sham, but not before the impostor managed to escape and inveigle himself into the court of the Maharaja, taking the unfortunate Miss Young Summers with him. They only reappeared in the hours before the Maharaja launched his attack. After the battle, Lark somehow managed to vanish again. Now here you are, masquerading as Lieutenant Fenris, a man we must presume died at Bundapur. Ballard stared at Jack as he finished speaking. The two men sat in silence, neither seemingly willing to speak. 
Finally, Ballard returned his gaze to the stack of papers in front of him. There is a third account of the events at Bundapur. He looked up to check for any sign of reaction. Jack did his best to look composed, but he was rattled. Ballard knew everything. This account also talks of the battle. Ballard broke the spell only after a long study of Jack's face. It bears little resemblance to Kingsley's own report of the fighting. Indeed, it claims that Captain Kingsley had scarcely anything to do with achieving the victory that he so righteously claims. Does that surprise you, Jack? Ballard's thin eyebrows arched as he posed the question. Jack was becoming confused. He'd expected to face an angry denunciation, yet there was little censure in Ballard's manner. Indeed, the intelligence officer seemed genuinely intrigued by the matter that had captured his attention. This third account also goes to great lengths to talk of the miscreant imposter Lark, Ballard continued, his eyes once again locked on Jack's. However, now we are told the man is a damn hero. The account reads like a Greek fable, and our friend Lark is made out to be some kind of Hercules who takes control when Captain Kingsley is incapacitated, which I suspect is a rather polite way of saying that he shirked the fight. It is only down to the heroic actions of this mysterious imposter that the cantonment is not overrun. If this third account is to be believed, Jack Lark is the one who saved us from the embarrassment of a heavy defeat. If that is true, the British government owes him a great deal indeed. Jack met Ballard's scrutiny as calmly as he could. He had guessed who had written the account. Isabel Young Summers is a determined young woman, is she not, Jack? Jack tried to hide his reaction, but he could not help but think of Reverend Young Summers' daughter and smile. He owed the spirited girl a great deal, she had rescued him once already. It now appeared she was doing so for a second time. It is time to put my cards on the table. Ballard broke the stair and shuffled his papers before opening the drawer and shoving them back into it. There was a finality to the action that caught Jack's attention. I don't give a damn who you may or may not be. Ballard steepled his fingers and peered at Jack from behind them. My job here is not to police the country looking for common criminals. I am no more concerned with your identity than I am with the casket of valuables you appear to have in your possession. Jack maintained his mask of indifference, yet his heart was pounding away like a battery of artillery being charged by a Russian column. I am tasked with two things, Jack, Ballard continued, both of equal importance. The first is to gather intelligence. To do that, I maintain a network of informers, uh, spies, if you will, who pass me any information that they deem out of the ordinary or that they think will be of interest to me. Should we go to war, this would, uh, of course, mean that it would be my remit to gather intelligence about the enemy. The Major placed his hands on the now empty desktop and fixed Jack with a keen stare. However, I have a secondary role one that vexes me a great deal, and which, to my mind, is just as important as the first. Ballard paused and looked across to his formidable bodyguard, who had stood silently throughout the questioning. The Major gave the briefest of nods, and the armed man turned and left the room. Jack and Ballard were quite alone. Jack watched the armed man leave, it surprised him that Ballard would choose to dismiss his bodyguard. For the first time he gave serious consideration to the idea of trying to escape. It would be a simple affair to leap on the Major and batter him into submission, but from there he had no idea what he would face or where he would go. The thought of another arduous and violent escape was an unappealing prospect, so he resolved to stay where he was and hear Ballard out. Besides, he was intrigued. He had the feeling something important was about to happen. My second role calls for absolute discretion at all times, Ballard continued, his eyes boring into Jack's skull. 
It is a sensitive task, and one that only suits a few very rare individuals, individuals with a set of skills that one simply does not find very often. Men like you, Jack. You don't mind if I call you Jack, do you? You can call me what you like. Jack had to fight the urge to lean forward as Ballard paused. Ah! Ballard barked sharply at the reply. Well said, that man. As it happens, I quite agree with you. It does not matter what a man is called. I believe people round here refer to me as the devil. I have no idea why, but I have never sought to correct them. I do not care what I am called, so long as people do what I tell them. It was not hard for Jack to see how the rest of the staff had conjured the nickname. It suited Ballard. He had an unearthly calm, a quality of disinterest, as if he were watching events from afar. I have need of a man with certain unique talents. Ballard read Jack's expression and smiled at his obvious desire to hear more. The work of my department is not what you would call ordinary soldiering. It is a little more... He paused, contemplating the next word. Circumspect. You appear to have many of the talents that I require. He paused once again before continuing. I would like to offer you employment, Jack. I want you to work for me. Chapter 10 Ballard rummaged in the drawers of the desk. The pause gave Jack a moment to collect the thoughts that had scattered as quickly as a routed column. He had believed he faced a denunciation and ruin, with a trip to a lonely scaffold looming over his future. The offer of employment had taken him by surprise. Yet it was more than just a job. Ballard was offering him a way to live a path away from the listless wandering that was all he had done since he had left Sawad so many months before. He was delivering Jack the one thing he craved more than anything else, a new future. Have you heard of Herat, Jack? Ballard finished his search and placed a thin leather folder on his desk. I have not, Jack answered honestly. The conversation had changed direction, he felt his unease settle deep in his gut. Not yet gone, but at least contained. I am not surprised. Let me divert you with a little story. Herat is an independent city just the other side of the northwest frontier. It is not a fine place. Indeed, from what I hear, it has very little to recommend it. But it assumes an importance quite beyond its design. You see... It sits slap-bang on top of the best route through the Hindu Kush, the only path a well-equipped army could hope to use to get through the mountain ranges. I do not need to tell you quite how much the bloody Russians would like to take it into their sphere of influence. As I'm sure you can imagine, we simply cannot allow a foreign power to exert control over such a strategically vital city. That would effectively give them a direct route into India and I am damn sure that if they succeed in their nefarious aim, then it won't take long for the Tsar to cast his beady little eyes over the whole of the northwest frontier. That thought gives the governor, and most likely the prime minister, sleepless nights. Ballard paused and fixed his gaze on Jack, reassuring himself that his unwilling student was paying attention. Now, until very recently, all has been well. Herat was ruled by a fellow called Saeed Muhammad. He did not like us very much, and he was most certainly firmly in the pocket of the Shah of Persia, but we were quite content with the situation so long as the Shah lived up to the terms of an agreement we got him to sign back in 37 that forbade him from interfering in the city's affairs. You said Herat was ruled by him. What has happened? Jack was pleased that he had spotted the way Ballard had phrased his description of the ruler of Herat. So you are paying attention. That is something to your credit, at least. Ballard did not seem in the least bit impressed. Well, unfortunately for poor Saeed, 
One of the local princes, Mohammed Yusuf Sadazai, did not take kindly to him being on the throne and bumped him off. Now our friend the Shah was not best pleased by this. He is no fool, he fully understands the importance of Herat. Indeed, he has long laid claim to the city, maintaining that it should fall under the power of his domain. He last made overtures to take it back in 52, but we managed to persuade him that his best interests lay elsewhere, and we succeeded in maintaining its independence. You see, we have long cultivated our relationship with the Persians. For years we made ourselves friends of the Shah, we used to supply his army, and we even sent in our officers to train his men. But over the last thirty years the ungrateful wretch has turned to the Russians for support. We know that they are forever whispering in his ear, and it seems he can no longer resist their call for him to take the city by force, especially as he has been led to understand that our commitments in the Crimea have somehow led us to take our eye off our affairs here in India. Jack had heard nothing of all of this, but then he had been concerned with little other than keeping Knightley out of trouble for the past few weeks, so it was not altogether surprising. What has he done? The Shah has used this revolt as an excuse to send a force to take the city. Ballard's face was grave. According to our latest reports, he has the place besieged, but I shouldn't wonder if he has managed to take it by now. He claims he is merely acting to restore order. Of course, what he means to do is to take the city for himself and annex it. We simply cannot allow that to happen. In a matter of days, we will declare war on the Persians. We have no chance of being able to reach Herat itself, it is too far inland, but we can mount a punitive attack that will make the Shah sit up and realise that if he dares to flout our will, there will be a high price to pay. We already have plans to put together a force to launch an attack. We face two choices of route, one by land, the other by sea. I have argued long and hard against going by land. That would mean taking a direct route through the northwest frontier, and, as I'm sure you are aware, the last time we tried that we were given a bloody nose for our pains. Therefore, as I see it, the preferable option is to strike at the Shah from the sea. The Indian Navy is already planning an amphibious operation. We shall hit hard and quickly and force the Shah to seek terms. That should put an end to his nonsense and give those damn Russians a thing or two to think about. I am to join the campaign and be attached to General Stalker's command, where I shall run the intelligence department. Ballard sat back in his chair, as if tired of the long lecture. He smiled at Jack. I want you to come with me. I'm to be your bodyguard. Jack was oddly disappointed. Ballard shook his head, showing the first sign of animation since he had lifted Jack from the street. No, I have Palmer for that. I presume he is the pleasant, chatty fellow I met. Indeed. Although he also carries out other more sensitive tasks as required. Like abduction. Ballard grinned. Yes, like abduction. Murder, too, if I order it. The smile was gone. Jack was beginning to understand the lie of the land. So, what am I to do if it is not to murder innocent officers on furlough? You are hardly the innocent, Jack. You have committed enough crimes to be hanged half a dozen times over. Perhaps. If I really am Jack Lark, of course. I think we both know that is the case. As I said before, I have no desire to hold you to account for any previous misdemeanours. I will provide you with a new identity, one that will actually stand up to more than a passing scrutiny this time. Jack felt the barbed comment keenly. Lieutenant Fenris was the third identity he had taken. Ballard knew something of the second. Jack felt an odd satisfaction that he knew nothing of the first. He would be the first to admit that his current guise was far from perfect, yet to hear his exploits casually demeaned offended him. I will also provide you with a new uniform. 
Ballard continued, his voice betraying no emotion as he played his final ace. It can replace the blue lancer's coatie you appear to have in your possession. Jack felt Ballard's grip tighten around his future. The blue cavalryman's uniform belonged to the commander of the Maharaja of Sawad's lancers, a rank and position that Jack had once held. Ballard's enforcer was clearly able to add burglary to his list of talents. They must have taken his knapsack from Knightley's rooms before they lifted him from the street. Ballard knew everything. How do I know I can trust you? Jack asked the question, despite being pretty certain that he already knew the answer. Ballard snorted. Of course you cannot trust me. I have no idea why you would think you can. Then why should I agree? Because otherwise, I don't think you have long left in the role of Lieutenant Fenris. Ballard placed the threat on the table without a visible qualm. So... Do as I'm told, or die. Jack sat back in his chair. I'm glad you see the picture, Jack. It shows I'm quite correct in choosing you for this role. So then. Jack plucked an imaginary piece of fluff from the cuff of his jacket. Now that that is out of the way, let's return to my earlier question. What am I to do for you? Ballard nodded slowly as he understood that he had secured Jack's agreement. I hate spies. I have my own, of course. I guard them closer than I would my children. But I simply cannot stand the thought of the enemy infiltrating men into our camp. A well-placed spy can endanger the success of an entire campaign, and I simply will not allow that to happen. I need an officer I can rely on to protect us from that threat. That will be your role, Jack. I want you to be my spy hunter. Jack felt the stirring of anticipation deep in his belly. And what do I do if I find any? Why? You kill them. You will be my assassin. Jack stood in front of the mirror in the suite of rooms he had been assigned. He turned to one side, inspecting the new uniform that had just been delivered by Ballard's own tailor. It fitted him well, just as an officer's uniform should. On his collar he wore the crown and star of a captain. Ballard had been as good as his word and had provided him with a new rank to go with the new uniform. He'd even returned the casket Jack had stolen from the Hotel Splendid. Jack's hall was a profitable one, and he had been able to lodge a good sum of money with one of the many agents who catered to the financial needs of the British officers arriving in Bombay. Quite whether he would live long enough to collect on his deposit was something he preferred not to dwell on. As he looked in the mirror, he saw an officer wearing the uniform of the 15th Hussars smiling back at him. The 15th possessed one of the longest regimental names in the entire army, the 15th, the King's, Regiment of Light Dragoons, Hussars, was an awkward title, the legacy of their conversion from Light Dragoons to Hussars some fifty years before. As Hussars, they had won renown in the wars against Napoleon, before earning a different kind of notoriety for their role in the events in Manchester that the newspapers had cruelly dubbed Peterloo, a day in the regiment's history that it would rather forget. The 15th were Major Ballard's own unit. He had told Jack that he had remained behind when the regiment had quit India three years previously, leaving the Madras presidency for a more sedate life in Manchester. Like many officers, Ballard had chosen to forgo a regimental posting in the dull safety of the English countryside, preferring to try his hand on the staff, where the prospects of advancement were much better. The army encouraged such postings, especially for officers like Ballard who had served long enough in their regiments to need to broaden their horizons as well as improve their prospects. It provided a corps of senior officers to fill the myriad roles required to administer the army's forces. Ballard now served with the Bombay Presidency, and his appointment as head of the intelligence department showed that he had chosen well. He was clearly going places, 
his current post merely a milestone on his route to the higher ranks. A Hazar captain was a suitable identity for Jack to adopt, and with no other officers from the regiment left in the country, it was unlikely that anyone would be able to denounce him as an imposter. With Ballard to vouch for him, Jack could feel safe for the time being at least. What would happen when he no longer featured in the Major's plans was anyone's guess, but he had learned to avoid looking too far into the future. It had a habit of changing. He wondered what Sarah Draper would make of his new appearance. As much as he tried to forget her, he found himself thinking of her often. She had shocked him, and in some ways her wanton behaviour had offended him. But no matter his somewhat prudish values, he knew he would not hesitate to leap back into her bed if that was what she desired. He could no more shake off his infatuation than he could discard his tulwa. His fabulous sword hung at his side, attached to the black patent leather sword belt that he wore underneath his jacket. It was not the dragoon sabre that regulations demanded, but he refused to be parted from it. The dolman jacket fitted like a glove, the dark navy cloth cut to hug Jack's figure so tightly that it constricted his breathing. It would take time to come to terms with the snug fit, as it would to become used to the lines of heavy gold chain lace that decorated the front of the uniform coat and the fancy pouch belt that ran over his left shoulder and underneath his right armpit. Jack had never been a British cavalry officer before. He would have to adjust to his new gaudy uniform just as he would have to shelve his deep-seated infantryman's distrust of the cavalry. The rest of the uniform was almost as tight as the dolman, the dark blue trousers with the wide gold stripe running down the seam clung to his legs, and he cautiously turned and looked at their fit over his backside. He was not pleased with what he saw, and not for the first time he cursed his weeks of inactivity. However, he could not be wholly dissatisfied with his new uniform, and he began to understand why the cavalry officers took such pride in their appearance. He lifted his chin and turned his face from side to side. Perhaps he would grow a pair of the mutton-chop whiskers that were all the rage among the debonair young men who served in the cavalry. It would at least give him something to do. The last weeks had passed with painful slowness. He had spent the days doing little. Ballard had handed over thick wads of documents detailing the current situation between the British and the Persians, and Jack had done his best to plough through the turgid texts, the dusty, dry language of officialdom testing his imperfect reading skills to the limit. What he discovered came as no surprise. Once upon a time, he had supposed that highly able and competent fellows conducted the affairs of state, just as he had assumed that effective generals led the army. His opinion of the army's senior ranks had been shattered by his experience in the Crimea, Everything he read of the political affairs of the British government in India confirmed that it was no more fortunate in its own senior staff. As he read the long-winded reports, he was left wondering quite how his country had ever managed to carve out an empire, let alone hang on to it for so long. Much of what he had read concerned the Honourable Mr James Murray, the British ambassador to Persia, and his ill-conceived affair with the wife of the Persian First Secretary. To put an end to the damaging scandal, the Shah had imprisoned the unfortunate lady concerned before demanding an apology from Queen Victoria herself for the actions of her representative. The affair spoke volumes for the strained relations between the two countries, a tension that had culminated in the British government declaring war a matter of days after the Shah had ordered the independent city of Herat to be placed under siege. For all of its tiresome and tedious nature, Jack relished his new role. To have been given a purpose filled him with a feeling of anticipation. He had drifted for too long, and it felt good to once again be part of the army, if only in the guise of a counterfeit captain. When the time came for the campaign to start in earnest, he was determined to seize the opportunity he had been given. He had become the devil's assassin, 
and he could not have been happier. Chapter 11 Halle Bay, 7th of December, 1856 The sun was high in the sky, but the water was cold. It lapped up to Jack's shoulders, soaking the gold braid on the front of his hussar's dolman so that he was dragged forwards. Had it been any deeper, it would have likely pulled him under. Don't let that get wet, Mr Fenris. Jack forced his arms straight, holding the heavy portmanteau as high above his head as his aching arms would allow. Palmer laboured along behind him, grunting with the effort of carrying a pair of small leather trunks, one balanced on each of his broad shoulders. A heavy splash further back told Jack that his new commanding officer had followed his small staff into the surf. The landings had been going on for several hours before the three men of the Army's intelligence department had been called forward to clamber down the thick rope net and into the small pinnacle that would ferry them closer to the shore. They would be leaving the comforts of the steam frigate Firoz behind, swapping their comfortable berths for the wild, open countryside of Persia. At least that was how Ballard had described it to Jack the previous evening as they contemplated their departure. Jack had done his best not to snort in derision. They would be serving on the staff. The only hardships they were likely to endure were the heat and the insects. They would not be expected to fight, nor would they be forced to sleep on the ground without the protection of a tent. Staff officers lived cheek by jowl with the men who would do the fighting, but their conditions were a thousand leagues above the hardship they expected the common redcoats to tolerate without murmur. The British troops were coming ashore at Halala Bay, around twelve miles south of the town of Bushir, one of the early objectives of the campaign. One full division had been dispatched with the task of enforcing Great Britain's will. Command of the expeditionary force had fallen to Major General Foster Stalker, an officer who had enjoyed a satisfactory, if not spectacular, career in the East India Company's army, most recently commanding the 2nd Bombay European Regiment. At his disposal he had five battalions of infantry, two squadrons of cavalry, two batteries of field artillery, one of horse artillery, and two companies of the Bombay sappers and miners. Drawn from the troops around Bombay, the small army was already a close-knit group, with many of the officers well known to one another. Their orders were simple. Teach the Shah that to flout British influence was to court disaster. Jack lifted his head and looked ashore. The air above the beach seemed to shimmer, the haze created by the heat blurring his view. The promise of the warmth to come sustained him as he struggled towards the sand, his breath coming in ragged gasps as he lumbered through the cold water. Despite the haze, he could see enough to understand that the division was disembarking in a calm and ordered fashion, with none of the chaos he had expected. The British landings in the Crimea had been a near disaster, the army thrown into the campaign in a display of utter mismanagement. It was clear that the Indian Navy would not tolerate such standards on their watch. As he stumbled through the surf, Jack could see the ranks of red-coated soldiers marching away from the landing area, heading towards their assigned bivouacs inland. Gunboats hovered in the bay, prowling backwards and forwards as they protected the exposed troops. The sailors had already been called into action. Some three to four hundred enemy troops had been waiting to contest the British landing, formed up in a grove of date trees around two hundred yards to the left of the beach. From their position they would have been able to pour a withering fire down on the heads of the first men coming ashore. Such resistance would have made the landings a bloody affair. The soldiers would have had to wade in from the small boats that brought them from the transports, enduring the enemy fire without being able to fight back until they were fully ashore. The casualties would have been horrendous. Fortunately, the keen eyes of the young officers on the gunboats had spotted the Persian force. It had not taken long for them to engage the enemy, and their bombardment had scattered the waiting troops, killing dozens in the process. 
Jack had watched the attack from the comfort of the Firos. At the time, he had applauded the calm demonstration of skill by the naval officers, a welcome spectacle for the soldiers waiting to go ashore. Now he was no more than one hundred yards from the target of the barrage, and he felt the shame of having joined in the celebratory cheers as other men had been dying and suffering on the receiving end of the cannon fire. He staggered out of the last of the surf and trudged through the soft sand, grateful to feel the power of the sun after the chill of the water. He saw the scorch marks where the navy shells had landed. The date grove had been destroyed by the well-directed fire, the trees shredded. The ground was littered with bodies and abandoned equipment and the smell of smoke and spilt blood caught at the back of his throat. It had been months since he had last fought, and it churned his stomach to once again witness the destructive power of battle. Some of the corpses had been literally torn apart, whilst others lay in the grotesque and twisted positions of death. He forced his eyes away from the macabre sight and stepped around a puddle of vomit. Clearly he had not been the only one affected by what he saw. Good man, Jack. Let's choose a place to set up, shall we? Major Ballard marched past, the water cascading from his soaked uniform. If the commander of the intelligence department was concerned at seeing the first enemy casualties of the campaign, he gave no sign of it. Jack traipsed after the major, using both hands to haul the portmanteau up onto the beach. Like the rest of the officers and men, the staff of the intelligence department carried the very minimum they needed. It would be some days before any of the heavier baggage could come ashore, so the troops marched without tents and with just three days' rations in their haversacks. Jack and Palmer had been forced to carry the other items that Major Ballard deemed essential. Judging by the weight of the bag Jack had lugged ashore, they consisted mainly of bulging ledgers and thick sheaves of papers. Quite why he required the contents of a small library in the earliest days of the campaign was beyond Jack's comprehension, but he had long ago learned not to fight the whims of a senior officer. The stove spluttered as it lit. The foul stew had been a gift from a lieutenant in the second Bombay Light Infantry, who had come ashore in the first wave and who had sensibly carried a fowling rifle with him. It spoke of Ballard's standing that he had been given a share of the precious pot, and Jack was beginning to sense that he was fortunate to be connected with the cadaverous major. It's a marvellous thing, is it not? Ballard poked the contents of the pan with the end of his pocket knife. I'm looking forward to tasting it. Jack's stomach growled as the aroma of the stew wafted his way. Should we save some for Palmer? He had barely spoken to Ballard's burly bodyguard, yet it would not do to forget the man. Jack was keen to get the other half of Ballard's staff on side, but the Major had dispatched his enforcer on an errand. He had not thought fit to tell Jack where or why. I am not talking about the stew, Jack. I doubt that will taste much of anything at all. Ballard sniffed as he contemplated the bubbling mixture. It was becoming clear that the Major had little time for food. He rarely ate, preferring to spend time reading the dozens of reports that came across his desk. It explained his sparse frame. In answer to your question, yes, I think we should save some for Palmer. The man eats like a veritable horse and we cannot possibly consume all this by ourselves. But I was referring to the stove, not to this concoction. Jack wondered at the mind of a man who could ignore a hot meal when faced with a night without shelter from the elements. It is a fine thing. Fine indeed. Ballard clearly did not share Jack's opinion. It is not fine. It is a marvel of modern engineering. It is a wonder that a Frenchman could have designed such a device. It takes but a morsel of combustible material, yet it produces the very maximum amount of output. Monsieur Soye is a genius, and he is quite correct to name this a magic stove. Jack was learning a great deal about Ballard's character. 
He was not interested in food, yet the machine that could cook it fascinated him. I wish we'd had these in the Crimea. He shivered as he remembered the misery of the first nights of the campaign that had led to the terrific bloodletting at the Alma River. Ballard looked up sharply. You fought in the Crimea? Where? At the siege? Jack scowled at his thoughtless remark. No, I was lucky. I missed that. The Major would not let him off the hook so easily. So, before that, then? At the Alma? Yes. Did you fight? Yes. It was a bloody affair, I hear. Ballard was watching Jack closely. He frowned. You could not have been Arthur Fenris in the Crimea. He would have been with the 24th at that time. His frown deepened as he realised he did not know all of Jack's story. You must have been someone else. Jack decided it would be best to steer the conversation away from his past. That looks done, sir. Ballard poked the thickened stew with his knife. You might well be right. He leant forward and twisted the control knob on the stove, shutting off the heat that was condensed from the enclosed burner and channeled into the stove itself. Please, help yourself. Jack did not need to be asked twice. He reached for the pan and started to eat. He was well into his third mouthful when he noticed Ballard staring at him. Will you tell me your story? The Major sat cross-legged on the ground, still watching Jack intently. The rest of it. You know most of it already. But clearly not all. Ballard leant forward and swirled his knife around the stew. He extracted a thick nugget of flesh that he inspected carefully before gingerly nibbling at one edge. No, not all of it. Jack gave the admission grudgingly. Does anyone? Does anyone know the full story of Jack Lark, the infamous charlatan? No, only me. That must be a burden, Ballard said softly. He paused, looking at Jack closely before he spoke again. You scream in your sleep. I heard you on the ship. Jack said nothing. He had shared a cabin with his commander on the Firos, but he had not gained the first indication that he had disturbed the Major's rest. He felt his cheeks flush, the intimacy of Ballard's words disconcerting. You're lucky. You sleep like a bloody baby. Ballard looked straight into Jack's eyes, as if searching them for knowledge. That is the benefit of a clear conscience. Perhaps that is something you lack. Jack saved himself from replying by filling his mouth, something he immediately regretted as the hot mixture scolded his tongue. He was surprised at Ballard's insight, but he had learnt never to share his memories no matter how tempting. He would keep his past to himself. So, what next? What would you have me do? Jack asked the question gruffly when his mouth was emptied, breaking the closeness that had been building between them. Ballard snorted but did not press further. It will take us one day to prepare to march, I imagine. Stalker landed this afternoon. He is an eager man and will be keen to get on before the powers that be decide this affair needs the services of a more senior officer with greater experience. He will want to garner some laurels before that happen. He is that kind of man. The Major made the observation seem like a criticism. I've never met him. You will. Tomorrow. He has summoned me to his headquarters. He will want to learn what manner of enemy we face. You can accompany me. Do you know what we face? Jack had no idea what Ballard knew. Of course. He frowned at the question. 
I shall deliver the information tomorrow. I have everything I need. Can you not tell me now? It would be good to know. Ballard snorted. You would not share your story with me. I think I shall now withhold my own. He grinned with childish glee. Jack smiled at the unexpected expression. Against all his better judgment, he was starting to like his new commanding officer. As you will, sir. What should I do now that we're here? You must start sniffing around. You are clearly adept at fitting in no matter what your surroundings. Make yourself known to people. Ferret around a bit. I will tell you when I have suspicions for you to act upon. Jack contemplated the instructions. His new role was clearly not going to be the simple soldiering he was used to. He had no responsibilities beyond Ballard's cryptic orders. He commanded no men, and he would not be expected to lead anyone into battle. Yet, his instincts told him that his life was in danger. He just did not know from where.